Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Thank you for your patience as I uh, battled some traffic to get here. Um, I'm Ed Remus, a longtime member of the Platypus Affiliated Society, and we're here tonight to talk about Debsey and socialism, uh, both the history and uh, the historical consciousness of the left vis-a-vis -vis Debsey and socialism. Um, but I thought we could start um, by just getting a sense from those of us in this room of what what you know about Debsey and socialism right now. Um, I'm genuinely curious about this because we're at a different moment in the left um, than that when I came up. I'm a millennial, um, and I think that um, certainly the, the watershed on the left of the rise of the Democratic Socialists of America, the two campaigns of Bernie Sanders, have perhaps done much to change people's perceptions of an awareness of Deb. So I'm just curious if we could go around the room a little bit, uh, maybe introduce yourself and tell me, um, you know, what is your name? And uh, if you're not a member of Platypus, I'm curious, like, what's, what's maybe the most salient fact you know about Debs or the party he led? Where did you learn it? And what do you take to be its political significance? Like, what, what do you know? Where did you learn it? And what's, what's the point? What's the upshot? Um, just want to hear from a few of you. Um, if you're a member of Platypus, maybe answer this question uh, from the perspective of before you joined Platypus, because those of us in Platypus learn and teach about Debs uh, some. And so um, we have a certain perspective on some of this history. Um, I'm curious to hear from a few folks in the room, though. Any volunteers? What do you know? Yeah. Um, I'm Ben. I am in Platypus. Um, I think the first time I like really like learned about Debs, not just in passing, was in a history class in high school. Um, I feel like um, the politics, I, I'm not sure if, if his politics were super like thoroughly talked about beyond just like he was socialist and sort of disidentified with sort of Democrats and Republicans. Um, but the most sort of salient um, aspect of his life and career was like his presidential run that won a couple hundred thousand votes and when he like ran from jail um, also, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't actually know that much more than that. Yeah. And I'm curious at that time, what did you take that to mean? Like with those pieces of knowledge, what, what did you think the point of that was? Well, I think it was in the broader context of the, um, I forget the specific word, but like you can't speak against the government, um, in wartime. And it, that, that was sort of the bigger picture that his his sort of politics were being filtered in, where he was like vociferously anti-war and that was sort of contra the, the US government. But it was very displaced from like this Im any sort of image of like a, a burgeoning socialist movement in the US. It just seemed like the way it was talked about was just he sort of had this support manifest out of almost nowhere, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wrong. that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, others? Yeah. So my name is Will. I just learned about Platypus today. Uh, I just got to Chicago. And I remember first learning about Eugene Debs and it was sort of, he, he was mentioned like off, just sort of offhandedly in, our, in, in my high school AP history class, right? And I, I remember like, and I'm paraphrasing this when I say like, if we are in prison, then we are all in prison, right? When he said that, that I think that like really, that, that struck an essential emotional core with me as to like why why leftism and why socialism, why making the world a better place is a place, right? Because it draws on the empathy that I think is within everyone that is sort of like it, it is rationalized and thought away from people. Right? Like if someone is suffering, if I see a homeless person on the side of the street, I like I feel that on a visceral level. I've related to that. I've had family members who were homeless in jail and like miserable in, in poverty, right? And it's like if you just like if you choose to ignore that, then you are choosing to ignore human suffering just in general, right? And I just I was like, yeah, that's that's like the first step to make change is to relate to people, you know, and feel their suffering. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense, and I'm curious. Um, did you think that had any political implications? What did that mean for politics? Well, I think, I mean, I, I think that like in order to make the, in order to make the world 
place in order to really get to the point where you are um, where you are anti-capitalist and where you want to uh, where you want to take like the, the, the political steps necessary, it has to operate out of the place of empathy. It can't you can't be removed from the suffering of say, you know black people in, in you can't you can't just you can't sequester yourself emotionally from that. It needs to come from a place that you, you, where, you, where you feel it, because otherwise you're just, you're not going to be acting in the best interest. It's going to be something, it, it's going to be making you feel better more than it is uh, something that is really for their benefit, for the, for the benefit of suffering people. So. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, good. And maybe one more. Um, something that hasn't been raised so far. Does anyone else want to? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, my name is Alex. Uh, I learned about this talk from a poster. Um, but I also learned about devs in high school, and the thing that stood out to me most was how it was like the first large-scale like showcase of workers' rights as a political union. I think that like. In high school, we talked a lot about like how unions started during the Industrial Revolution. We never talked about how the logical next step would be like a socialist political movement. And then Debs was like the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, good, good. So um, what I have for you tonight, it's uh, a lot of text to read. And so I thought I would break it up in two parts. And in the first part, I just want to give you a sense from a perspective consistent with what we teach in Platypus of what the Debsian Socialist Party of America was. Um, because some of you coming here um, might not know very much about that and might want sort of a, a picture um, of, of some depth, but, but nonetheless a picture. And I figured at that point we could have some Q&A, maybe take a break. Um, and then in the second part, I want to talk about how various intellectuals and organizers and activists on the left have thought about the history and the legacy of the Debs era Socialist Party over the past century. Um, so that's more about the historical consciousness of the left, perhaps what historians in the academy would call historical memory, right? So that's kind of the two parts I have for tonight, but it's a lot of text. And so we can break it up. I'll get through the first part. We'll talk, take a break, and then I'll launch into the second part. Um, so the Socialist Party of America is a unique phenomenon in American history. Of the many third parties to which American politics has given rise, few of these parties have claimed socialist revolution as their goal. Of these few, none but the Socialist Party of America has transcended the sectarian party model to operate as a genuinely mass party distinct from and opposed to the parties of capitalist progressivism. Moreover, no socialist party in the United States has gained a wide, as widespread a presence in American life as did the SPA during the lifetime of its five-time presidential candidate, Eugene Debs. Following the mass party model promulgated by the Marxist theoretician Karl Kautsky, the SPA featured multiple civil social constituencies multiple organizational strategies, and multiple internal factions that cooperated and often competed within a single political party aimed at socialist revolution. While the SPA persisted as a party organization for many decades after Eugene Debs' death in 1926, the period between its 1901 founding and its 1919 crisis is generally taken to be the SPA's high water mark, and Debs supported the SPA's mass party model during this period, though Debs often took clear sides in the party's numerous and bitter factional disputes within the party. For this reason, the term Debsian socialism has come to refer not only to Eugene Debs's individual political commitments narrowly considered, but to the Socialist Party of America between the years 1901 and 1919 more broadly. For some, the Debs era SPA remains the single best and perhaps the only model of a mass revolutionary political party for socialism in the United States. The SPA and its leaders did not envision socialist revolution as an exclusively political revolution, as a mere regime change within capitalism. Neither did they imagine socialist revolution as an undemocratic coup, coup d'etat or putsch. The Debs era SPA aimed to take governing political and social power in the United States 
in concert with mass socialist parties that were then organized in countries throughout the world. These parties participated in an avowedly Marxist representative body, the Second International, which was founded in 1889, which aimed to coordinate its member parties' efforts through meetings and conferences of party delegates. Their goal of social revolution referred not only to a situation in which they won the ability to exercise governing political power across industrialized countries, but also, and this is crucial, to a situation in which socialists organized and prepared the working class to exercise conscious control of society's production. In Debs era terms, socialist revolution meant seizing control of the economic trusts and using them to abolish unemployment, poverty, and drudgery on a global scale. It also meant eliminating the political inequalities that capitalist states placed on women, black Americans, and many others. These goals were born of bourgeois democratic social and political demands. In other words, these were not specifically socialist political demands. They were demands raised out of the bourgeois revolution. They were broadly democratic demands, but they were expressed under industrial conditions. They were theorized by Karl Kautsky, an Orthodox Marxist theorist based in Germany, whose writings such as the class struggle and the social revolution inspired SPA founders such as Eugene Debs, Victor Berger, and Morris Hillquit. One can begin to understand the SPA's multifactional character by examining the subtle differences of political vision that existed between Debs and Victor Berger circa 1905, the year in which Debs joined fellow SPA member and labor leader Big Bill Haywood in founding the Industrial Workers of the World, or the IWW. In Debs's vision, the goal of socialism was twofold. First, it tasked socialists with organizing skilled and unskilled workers on an industry-wide basis to prepare to confiscate and assume operation of the trusts. Socialists could organize new industrial unions for this purpose insofar as the established craft unions of skilled workers in the American Federation of Labor, AFL, proved unwilling to organize unskilled workers. The goal of socialism simultaneously tasked socialists with organizing a political party that could use electoral campaigns and elective offices for various purposes. One purpose would be to support socialists and unionists organizing efforts across civil society. Another would be to uphold civil liberties. Another would be to win reforms that benefit the working class. Another purpose would be to educate mass audiences on the tenets of socialism. Whether organized in craft or industrial unions, socialists could spread socialist ideas among the rank and file. Once socialists succeeded in building a mandate for socialism throughout the working class, their political party could be used to register this mandate in elections and to defend this mandate via state power against any attempt at capitalist counter-revolution. For Debs, in short, the instrument of socialist revolution was less a narrowly electoral political party with a civil social base. Rather, it was a mass civil social movement with an electoral party arm. In Victor Berger's vision, on the other hand, Socialists were tasked with winning an electoral mandate for an elected socialist government to buy out the capitalists who owned the trusts and thereby inaugurate a social revolution. Despite this willingness to buy out the capitalists, Berger still maintained that the surest safeguard against capitalist counter-revolution would be an armed working class. The Socialist Party's purpose for Berger was to win elections and prove that socialists could deliver responsible government once in office. Berger hailed every municipal reform as a step forward in society's gradual evolution towards socialism. He championed the theoretical revisionism of German Marxist Edward Bernstein, author of the book Evolutionary Socialism. And Berger, like Bernstein, thought that the capitalist interest in society could be subordinated to a political majority within liberal democracy. Explicitly revolutionary rhetoric, Berger feared, the kind that came from the SPA's left wing, would only serve to alienate middle-class voters who were needed for his electoral strategy. However desirable it may be to organize workers on an industry-wide basis, Berger held, the most reliable electoral base for the SPA remained the AFL-affiliated craft unions of skilled workers. Like Debs, Berger recognized that AFL leaders like Samuel Gompers opposed socialism and reserved their political support for the capitalist parties. Socialists should therefore bore from within the AFL, Berger thought, to advocate for socialism among the ordinary members of their existing unions, 
There was an alternative strategy within the party at this time of boring from without by organizing dual socialist unions among the unskilled. But Berger cautioned that this would only provide fodder for the anti-socialist critics in the labor movement who accused the socialists of dividing the labor movement. Now, um, to break this up a little bit, I brought some books that I think are representative of um, some of the literature on Debsian socialism. And I thought I had one of Victor Berger's writings, but apparently I did not bring it. Um, but pretty soon I'll start passing these around. And when I do, please just uh, don't take them home with you. Um, if a central tension can be said to animate both the history and the historiography of Debsian socialism, it is that between Debs's political vision, which is variously described as industrial unionist, revolutionary, and left-wing on the one hand, and on the other hand, Berger's political vision, which is variously described as trade unionist, opportunist, electoralist, constructivist, reformist, revisionist, and right-wing. Yet the meaning of this very tension for the fate of the SPA can only be understood with reference to the fates of the Social Democratic Party in Germany and the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in Russia. Like Debs and Berger, the leaders of these parties were inspired by the writings of Marx and Engels and by the writings of their great popularizer, Kautsky. So what did they take from these writings? What lessons did these leaders of, of these mass social democratic parties of the Second International draw from Marx and Engels and from Kautsky, who popularized Marx and Engels thought? Well, from the suppressed revolutions of 1848, Marx concluded that the bourgeoisie would henceforth play a counter-revolutionary political role, and that the struggle to achieve bourgeois democratic demands in society and politics on a universal basis had henceforth fallen to the working class. In the 1871 Paris Commune, Marx identified the germ of the future form of working class self-organization, what he called the dictatorship of the proletariat, that could affect a political transition from capitalism to socialism. And, after witnessing the joint Franco-Prussian suppression of the Paris Commune, Marx recognized the need for a socialist political party that would prepare to assume and defend proletarian governing power. These three basic concepts, the working class leading the bourgeois democratic revolution and capitalism, the goal of this revolution being the dictatorship of the proletariat as a transitional stage towards socialism, and the socialist political party as leading the working class towards this goal, appear consistently in Eugene Debs' speeches and writings uh, after the time in the mid 1890s when Victor Berger converted him to Marxism as Debs was sitting in jail in Woodstock, Illinois. Perhaps most significant of all, however, was the political lesson that Marx drew from the rise of Napoleon III, a lesson that would be crystallized in Marx's concept of Bonapartism. During the 1848 revolutions in Europe, workers in France demanded an expansion of the franchise, hoping that a wider electorate would force the state to pursue policies that would address the industrial crisis of society, unemployment, by guaranteeing a right to work, universal full employment. Having won universal male suffrage, French workers in 1848 elected Louis Napoleon Bonaparte as president on his promise to create state workshops for the unemployed. This he did, and he did much more besides. After undertaking a coup d'etat in order to save suffrage rights, Napoleon III's government, in the words of historian Helena Rosenblatt, quote, seemed to constitute a new and hybrid type of rule, popular but authoritarian, both a police state and a welfare state. While the emperor used censorship and surveillance to stifle any opposition, he offered workers an unprecedented range of relief measures, soup kitchens, price controls on bread, insurance schemes, retirement plans, orphanages, nurseries, hospitals, and all of this was widely reported in the state-controlled press at the time. Caesarism, or Bonapartism, these were sort of interchangeable terms at the time, became the name for a modern form of democratic dictatorship, or illiberal democracy, right? It's kind of a complex concept sometimes for us to consider. Um, that these two could actually go together and there was a certain logic to them going together politically um, in capitalist politics. On this basis, Marx concluded that the reconstitution of capitalism would draw its strength from the capitalist state's implementation, albeit partial and selective, of the very political and societal demands that had been championed by the working class movement for socialism itself. 
In Debs' time as in ours, this Bonapartism, this illiberal democratic state capitalist politics, was referred to as progressivism. As an aside, while the failure and defeat of the SPA turns largely on its relationship to progressivism, and I'll be telling you more about that in a minute, the party's formation and rise turns largely on its relationship to populism. So uh, it's a preview of what's to come, but if you're trying to understand the failure and defeat of Debsian socialism, you need to understand its relationship to progressivism. But if you're looking at its rise, actually the party's relationship to populism is very important. Berger recruited, Victor Berger recruited Debs to Marxism based on their common involvement in the Populist Party of the 1890s. In this milieu, Berger and Debs also recruited the socialist Julius Wayland, who published the SPA's immensely popular newspaper, The Appeal to Reason, out of Girard, Kansas, where the SPA came to operate a fairly strong statewide party. Broadly speaking, populist currents fed more easily into the SPA, especially initially, because they represented the sections of the middle class that were declining and that were not being integrated into the emerging new order of statist capitalism in the progressive era. Whereas progressive currents tended to root within the SPA on a more temporary basis. Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma, for example, was once home to a remarkably strong socialist state organization. James R. Green's 1978 book, Grassroots Socialism, Radical Movements in the Southwest, reveals the, Oklah the Oklahoma socialists to have recruited small farmers away from the neo-populist rhetoric of the Democrats. The socialists held week-long summer revivalist encampments that attracted a growing class of landless tenant farmers to socialist politics. They recruited black and Mexican workers into tenant union unions and did more than most Northern socialists to recruit black members to the party. They did so despite the fact that black Americans under Jim Crow could not contribute votes to the SPA and were often politically tied to the federal government's patronage via the Republican Party or to a black nationalist politics. After 1907, the Oklahoma SPA won the allegiance of the India Homa Farmers Union organizers, whose political strategy and program consisted of cooperative enterprises, crop withholding, and agrarian reform. Many of these seasoned SPA activists were former populists. So again, if you're trying to understand the rise of the SPA, a big part of this is the crisis and decline of populism and remnants of that populist politics being recruited in some way picked up by the Socialist Party. Ultimately though, as mentioned, the SPA's fate ended up turning on its relationship to progressivism. Marx's concept of Bonapartism enables us to view the fate of the mass socialist parties of the Second International in what we might call dialectical terms. These parties did not simply confront the capitalism of the Second Industrial Revolution as an outside force. Rather, these parties transformed capitalism from within, and this presented them with novel problems and tasks of their own making. It is no coincidence that the growth of these socialist parties into genuinely mass political parties only happened during the 1890s, which is the beginning of the period we now recognize historically as the Progressive Era. In broad terms, between 1890 and 1914, Karl Kautsky's Social Democratic Party of Germany failed to differentiate itself from progressivism at the level of political practice, and it thereby became an instrument of progressive counter-revolution. The SPD organized the German working class in support of the First World War, and SPD officeholders Friedrich Ebert and Philipp Scheidemann ordered the killing of Rosa Luxemburg. These are just some famous examples. This bequeathed what Platypus member Richard Rubin has termed the German problem to the history of socialism, right? Organized party, ostensibly revolutionary, but it actually becomes an instrument for counter-revolution. Meanwhile, by breaking definitively from the progressivist political tendencies that arose within Russian social democracy in the form of Menshevism and revisionist Marxism, under Lenin, the Bolshevik party prepared itself to become an instrument of proletarian revolution in 1917. It did this successfully. But it found its prospects for socialist transformation blocked in light of the SPD counter-revolution in Germany. The Bolshevik party therefore began degenerating into an instrument of counter-revolution in the historically novel form of Stalinism, which involved among other things, the bureaucratization of the party and of society. And this bequeathed the Russian problem to the history of socialism, right? So we have the German problem, we have the Russian problem. 
So what then is the American problem, right? If we're talking about these three mass socialist parties, one in Germany, one in Russia, and now we're looking at the one led by Eugene Debs in the United States, how do we frame the American party with reference to these other two examples? The American problem in the history of socialism could be described as the eclipse of the socialist party by state capitalist progressivism before the socialist party in America was ever fully built, such that in America, the Socialist Party never fully matured into either a total instrument of revolution to smash the capitalist state, as it did in Russia, or into an instrument of progressive state capitalist counter-revolution, as it did in Germany in the SPD. There are many ways to narrate this eclipse of the Socialist Party of America by progressivism. One could start with Elmer Beck's History of the Sewer Socialists, and this book is online. If you search the Internet Archive, Elmer Beck, Sewer Socialists, it's an interesting read. Um, it's a history of the electoral machine that Victor Berger organized and led in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Typically, when Socialist Party of America candidates ran for elected office in American cities, they were outmaneuvered politically by middle class progressives and they lost the election. This is what often happened. In other cases, middle-class progressives initially welcomed the socialists into office, because remember, this is a massively corrupt era where almost every municipal administration was just a total political machine of graft and corruption. So the progressives initially welcomed the socialists into office. They saw them as efficient stewards of city government. But when the socialists actually began trying to organize working-class participation in politics to increase that, right? or when the socialists actually began trying to improve the conditions of working class neighborhoods in these cities, the progressives joined ranks with businesses and with old guard politicians in successful anti-socialist two-party fusion campaigns where the two parties basically fuse and put up a candidate to block the socialists. Um, and this would lead to the socialist defeat. So here's one book. It's not necessarily the best on this subject, but I figured I'd just start passing things around if people want to take a look. Um, again, please just don't take it home with you. Um, so this was the typical pattern. Now, Victor Berger was one of the few SPA organizers who knew how to solve this problem to some degree. Berger's strategy was to organize SPA members to attain positions of leadership in Milwaukee trade unions such that Berger came to lead a layer of SPA personnel who occupied simultaneous leadership positions in the party on the one hand and in the unions on the other. Same personnel occupying leadership in both, both types of organizations. Um, Berger described this approach as the personal union, quote unquote, and throughout the party, it became known as the Milwaukee idea. It served as a model for the SPA's municipal electoral strategy nationwide and the SPA had elected around 1,000 of its members to office nationwide by the time of its electoral peak in 1912, thanks in no small part to the attempt to emulate in other cities the model that Victor Berger had pioneered in Milwaukee. Berger's Milwaukee idea strategy depended on socialists' willingness to work with conservative unionists to preserve the party's alliance with local labor. Unions remained wedded to the Milwaukee SPA because the socialists there proved themselves capable of re writing reform sentiments into office, and the socialists proved themselves capable of delivering clean, honest government once they were elected. This they, they did pretty faithfully. But as a strategy for building electoral support for the Socialist Party's ultimately revolutionary aims, right? Again, proletarian control of the trusts, which was an aim that Berger shared, however, uh, conservative his, his means may have been. Berger's Milwaukee idea was ultimately eclipsed by the Democratic Party's Woodrow Wilson administration, which took office in 1912, and by Wilson's progressive policy of integrating the labor movement, uh, I'm sorry, the labor bureaucracy into the capitalist state. So what did this look like? Well, there were signs of progressivism's coming eclipse of socialism even before the First World War. For example, Mother Jones, a labor organizer and IWW co-founder, quit the SPA in 1911. She accused it of being a party of nothing more than middle-class job seekers who were divorced from the labor movement. Right? This is a kind of anarcho-syndicalist critique of or rejection of the Socialist Party at that time. But interestingly, Jones is not the only uh, 
ultra leftist, you might say, or anarcho syndicalist to end up ultimately joining the camp of progressive capitalist politics. By 1916, she endorsed Woodrow Wilson for re-election, arguing that Wilson would be more accommodating to labor than his Republican opponent. Indeed, as the historian David Montgomery argues, the Democratic Party's uh, electoral triumphs of 1910 to 12 meant that increasingly labor mediation services and working condition standards no longer depended upon the voluntary agency of business leaders. In other words, labor and capital weren't just negotiating off in private in civil society away from the purview of the state. Rather, these negotiations could be enforced by the coercive authority of the federal government, thanks to the Democrats coming into office. It was this exercise of state power in a manner favorable to labor, the historian Montgomery concludes, that caused many unions to endorse Woodrow Wilson's Democrats in 1916. Socialist prospects for achieving leadership of the American labor movement were thereby eclipsed. And I should mention here, the socialists actually had a near majority in the AFL at one time. I believe it was within the first decade of the, of the 20th century. So this was not automatic. It was not automatic that uh, Wilsonite Democratic Party progressive politics would eclipse the Socialist Party and the labor movement. That had to be affected politically. Um, Corporate executive support for regulation and reform at a local, state, and national level only strengthened this political logic, earning support for the Democrats among working class voters and labor leaders. So in Wisconsin, let's take this back to what this looks like in Victor Berger's Wisconsin. The State Federation of Labor had already come to rely by 1915 on lobbying for the enactment of labor legislation instead of working only through the introduction and steering of bills by socialist legislators. So the socialist leg legislators are no longer playing a significant of, of a role in, in working for the labor movement, representing it um, in, in office. Uh, Beck writes this. And for this, they needed the cooperation of non-socialists in order to get bills passed. This attenuated the effectiveness of Victor Berger's personal union strategy, as did the incorporation of labor's right to organize into the rules of the War Labor Board and the representation of labor on capital estate bodies, such as the National Council of Defense, the Emergency Construction Board, the Fuel Administration Board, the Food Administration Board, and the War Industries Board. It's hard to underestimate the significance of this, right? This is one of the first times that the progressive capital estate begins to very aggressively begin managing the economy and integrating the bureaucracy of the labor movement in that management in kind of a political coalition, right? The two foremost exemplars of Berger's personal union strategy in Wisconsin, Fred Brockhausen and Frank Weber, vigorously supported the war and served in the labor defense councils. They remained active SPA members in Wisconsin throughout this period, despite the fact that at a national level, the SPA had adopted a staunchly anti-war position with its St. Louis Proclamation of 1917. So the leftists and you know, probably even the center of the SPA at this point are very much anti-war, in 1917, they, they adopt a staunch anti-war position, the St. Louis Proclamation. But there's autonomy of, of the state and local branches in the SPA. So you do have a minority of Socialist Party members during this period who are effectively joining or collaborating with this kind of progressive state management of um, the capitalist war effort, right? And kind of brokering labor's interest in, in, that, in that coalition. Indeed, Berger's machine was not representative of the SPA as a whole. Many notables broke with the party to pursue progressive capitalist politics on account of their opposition to the SPA's anti-war stance. In other words, like many leading intellectuals of the party actually left the party because they supported the war and the party did not. Ronald Radish's 1969 book, American Labor and United States Foreign Policy, highlights the role of the Wilsonian socialists who left or were expelled, in some cases, from the SPA on account of its position on the war. These notables coalesced around the progressive pro-war Social Democratic League, which worked closely with Samuel Gompers' American Alliance for Labor and Democracy. Through the SDL, they provided intellectual and organizational support to the AFL's participation in the war effort and liaised with European socialists on behalf of the war administration. Remember, so you have, um, you actually have certain sections of the second international socialists in Europe who are on board with the allied war effort. And so you have the, 
Um, you have the Wilson administration recruiting socialists out of the Socialist Party to sort of liaise with, with them. These ex-socialist notables included the intellectual Walter Lippmann, the muckraking journalist Charles Edward Russell, the one-time International Socialist Review editor and correspondent of Karl Kautsky named Algie Martin Simons, the writers Upton Sinclair and John Spargo, and the inter intellectual and organizer William English Walling. The poet Carl Sandburg, some, who some of you may know, uh, once an organizer for Victor Berger's Milwaukee branch of the Socialist Party, authored sympathetic treatments of the AALD and actually informed on Victor, Victor Berger for US military intelligence. And then during and after the war years, and this is the real climax in some ways, uh, the Socialist Party of America suffered what was arguably the single greatest episode of domestic political repression in American history. And I think one of you alluded to this um, in, in your comments before I, I started speaking. Um, so the party found its papers grounded, its duly elected representatives, including Victor Berger to US Congress, unseated. They were simply not allowed to take office, even though they had been duly and fairly elected. Um, leaders such as Eugene Debs, as most of you probably know, were jailed um, for, for dissenting uh, speech in wartime. Many others were charged on conspiracy and thousands of the Socialist Party's members were just scattered. And, you know, I should, I should mention, think, think about a time, you know, especially for more rural branches, like you see in, in rural outposts of the party, like you see in Oklahoma, think it would, what, of what it would have meant for the party's mail to be grounded, you know, for the Postal Service not to deliver the party's mail on federal orders. Um, this had an incredibly scattering effect on the party. And this, this, I would say, marked the final triumph of progressive capitalist politics over proletarian socialism in the era of Eugene Debs. Now, because the German problem of socialist counter-revolution conditioned the Russian problem of socialism in one country, right, going back to the sort of big picture view, and this meant the stillbirth of the world socialist revolution that began with the October Revolution of 1917, the communists, 1919, split from the Socialist Party of America in anticipation of supporting and, its, and spreading that world revolution on American shores necessarily appears to us in historical retrospect to have been premature, right? If not destructive of socialism's political prospects altogether. After all, the very worst fears of Leon Trotsky's American protégés, such as Louis Freyna, were never quite realized. The SPA's right-wingers, such as Victor Berger and Morris Hillquit, never fully reprised the counter-revolutionary roles played by the likes of Ebert and Scheidemann, no matter how trade unionist in their politics or revisionist in their Marxist theory, they undoubtedly were. One may ask whether the SPA right would have done so if it had been presented with the opportunity. Would someone like Victor Berger have uh, you know, authorized the killing of someone like Eugene Debs had a revolutionary situation broken out. We can speculate about this, right? How far we can take that German comparison. Um, and there is some plausibility to this, given that Berger's political machine began to fuse with the capitalist state war effort, as I, as I indicated. Meanwhile, if we set the ultra-left syndicalism of Big Bill Haywood to one side, and if we take Eugene Debs to be the most consistent representative of the party's revolutionary left wing, it is worth noting that Lenin very plausibly referred to Debs as the quote-unquote American Babel. Babel was a longtime leader of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. Lenin did not refer to Debs as the American Luxembourg, let alone as the American Lenin. Like Babel and Kautsky, Debs came to prize party unity above almost all other considerations, though he waged a remarkably consistent long-term faction fight against trade unionism and electoralism within the Socialist Party. Had it become genuinely necessary for American Marxists to split the SPA in order to advance the working class's struggle for socialism, however, one can surmise that Debs may not have been among the first to recognize this necessity. And perhaps he would have failed to recognize it completely. We will never really know. To be sure, Debs stood staunchly against capitalist progressivism, whether that progressivism arose beyond the party or within it. We can say that of Debs. But did, did Debs recognize, as Lenin did, that it was the working class movement and party for socialism itself that was driving this progressivism forward, in a sense, in capitalism, 
and making this progressivism manifest within the party's own ranks in the form of trade unionism, revisionism, reformism, right? Such that it would become necessary to split the party. Did Debs have this fully dialectical conception? For Marxists, this question is not unimportant. But here again, as a matter of historical fact, it was rendered moot by the failure of the world revolution circa 1917 to 23, and by the consequent political stillbirth, I think it's fair to argue, of the communist parties that arose around the Third International. So in the next part of the talk, I want to address how the Debsian Socialist Party has been variously remembered over the subsequent 100 years. Um, but I thought I would pause here and just stop. Um, I hadn't ended up speaking quite as long as I thought I would, um, but I thought perhaps, um, well, actually, fairly long time. So um, let's maybe just take some questions in, in what I've presented to you so far. Is anything sort of unclear or obscure? Or do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry. You mentioned toward the beginning of your talk this this approach to using the trusts. First, can you go into more specifics about what actually is a trust and how that relates to the sort of socialist paradigm, the actual political program that is, is being forwarded by Debs et al? Yeah, that's that's a good question. One one reading I would refer you to would be Lenin's Imperialism, uh, the highest stage of capitalism. Um, I think that that understanding that that Lenin reveals there um, is broadly consistent with that of the, the leaders of the Socialist Party of America. There may be some interesting differences, but that'll at least give you a, a flavor. But I think in very broad terms, the idea is that, um, you know, the, the, the sort of um, the, the classical liberal heyday of the mid 19th century is over, right? Like the kind of, you know, free for all free market capitalism um, of, you know, very small and medium sized producers is passing out of historical existence. And in all of the major areas of social and economic life, there is a centralization of capital, a convergence of firms, you know, vertical integration. Um, and increasingly, this comes to depend on um, integration between companies and finance. And increasingly, this depends on some kind of regulation by the state. And so um, you see that there's sort of a link between you know, firms are getting larger and larger. It's much more difficult for small competitors to penetrate the market. Um, it depends a lot on the financialization of these firms. Um, and there's a political, it, it, you're also seeing the state now take a very active role in sustaining and propping up, um, sometimes deeply corrupt ways. Um, and, and other times simply it becomes a matter of the giant corporations, quasi monopolies needing, sometimes literal, just plain monopolies requiring certain degrees of, of regulation by the state. And so um, I think the, the idea is that, that that marks a watershed that has been passed from what we might think of as like the days of Jeffersonian America, of the yeoman farmer and the, you know, the small craftsman, that what it means to, um, to sell your labor in, in the world is now different, right? And um, these, I, I think there's also a sense of irresponsibility in the sense that these uh, trusts are making decisions that um, are very tied in with the capital state and with capitalist politics, but there's no real political responsibility around organizing them and structuring them and directing them in the interests of working people, right? So there's a sense that if you have the capitalist parties in charge, they just direct these things on the basis of self-interest and corruption, and then there's no real vision. That's a very basic answer, but I would also invite, you know, I think we have others here in the room who might, yeah, Marco. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, you made some comparisons during the talk to uh, the, the, the German Socialist Party, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how you would sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, like, would you consider the American Socialist Party as uh, the PSPA as a second international party? Oh, and and if, if that's the case, like my sense of it, just like from my own research and stuff has been that like, it was actually very sort of like distant organizationally mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. that. And if, yeah. if, the, if the two big powers that were coming uh, like basically to replace 
Britain, you know, or Germany and, and the United States mm -hmm. during the, in Japan uh, mm -hmm. during the Second Industrial Revolution. Like, why, like, and, and with all that, you know, socialist organization happening in the United States, why does it seem that, like, the United States didn't play the, the role, uh, ex you know, like a bigger role in the, in the revolutionary process of the 1910s? Yeah, so I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And then I think I would break it into two parts. One would be like, was it a party of the Second International? And what was the character of that? And then maybe the second question is, why the apparent lag, so to speak, or delay? Like, why does it seem a step behind? Um, so to answer the first question, um, it, it definitively was. I mean, you, you'll find the Amer Americans sending delegates to all of the major conventions. There was actually something I've left out of my account, but there was actually a very small competitor um, Marxist party in the United States called the Socialist Labor Party, led by uh, someone who was largely a theoretician, Daniel de Leon, and who um, I believe actually Lenin credited the notion of um, the very concept of... Um, Oh, I'm forgetting now. It's not the dictatorship of the proletariat, I don't think. It's, it's something, it, it might be a kind of Soviet government. I think it's something like the concept of a Soviet government. Labor aristocracy, it says lieutenants, lieutenants of capital or something like that. Labor yeah. lieutenants of capital, yeah. That, yeah, so that, that comes from, so you do see this intellectual interchange and that's already probably as of the 1890s, even before the founding of the party. Um, so in the party congresses, there are actually, I mean, this is kind of a side issue. There's, there's a lot you could say on this, um, but that's actually one issue that comes up is um, almost as in the Russian case where you have the social Democrats saying, you know, you Americans should really find a way to resolve your differences and, you know, field a united delegation to this conference, right? Um, but the differences were sort of intractable and they involved in part how to relate to the, the labor movement. Um, I will say, so there's a lot of, there's at least some historiography on this. The best article, um, probably in terms of uh, depth of treatment, is by Sally Miller. Um, now, she, in her career as a historian, she basically tries out a few different varieties of deep hostility to Marxism um, in, in her interpretation of the Social Party of America. But nonetheless, I'm sure that you know, she's a, a very careful historian. But, but I think that informs in part her conclusion, which is um, you know, she basically argues that this what did the what did the leading American socialists get out of their participation in the Second International? Well, they patted themselves on the back and they they talked a lot of hot air and they they thought they were you know very fine and profound Marxists and then it didn't really matter, um, you know. So I think that's I don't think that's the full picture, um, but that is her interpretation. Um, you do see a lot of intellectual interchange. Um, for example, Karl Kautsky, I mentioned Milwaukee. Someone who's around Victor Berger's um, Milwaukee Socialist Party branch, especially um, initially, he, he later becomes a pro-war socialist, is Al G. Martin Simons. And he, um, you know, very, in a way very kind of consistent with Berger's electoralism, um, undertakes a study of how the party is appealing to farmers. And part of the idea is that to win beyond the cities where there's a strong labor movement base, um, Simons is thinking about how can we appeal to or capture the discontents of these farmers out in the counties or you know on the hinterland to get their votes. And so you actually see Kautsky sort of chiding him a little bit for that and saying, well, we're not just about vote getting, but nonetheless, this is an interesting study of the agrarian situation. And he actually takes some of those ideas back to Germany and the German party. What he does with them, I'm not quite sure. Um, but that's one of just many examples that could be listed of this kind of intellectual interchange. Um, of course, one of the um, most famous or infamous examples is that Berger supports, he sort of follows the base of the AFL, the, the traditional craft skilled labor movement in supporting um, Chinese exclusion, I believe it is, like, like the exclusion of low wage immigrant labor, and I believe especially from China or East Asia. And so this becomes very controversial, you know, rightly so within the Second International, um, you know, with him pointing out that um, workers are being brought here to break strikes and lower, you know, the conditions of the reproduction of the working class. And all correct, the, left, the leftists of the party say, but nonetheless, we need to organize them, right? We don't want to collaborate with the capitalist state to grow the power of the state to keep out one section of the working class. Like, Yes, they're being brought in to break strikes and lower wages and everything you say, 
but the task is to organize them. So you can see, um, you know, some of the uh, the the internal divisions within the Socialist Party of America playing out, you know, at, at some of these party congresses. I think more should be written on that. I think it's an understudied topic. Um, but as to the second question, you know, why why does the Socialist Party of America seem like a latecomer? You know, and especially given like the competing hegemonic aspirations of... I wasn't even thinking of, of it in terms of latecomer. I was thinking more in terms of uh, like distance than, than lateness. Like, like I, I feel like there's like a... Like my, my interpretation would be something like, you know, you have these like delayed bourgeois revolutions uh, in Central Europe, uh, in, in Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that like, like and, and that kind of like... Um, uh, I don't know, uh, old, 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 old fashioned uh, ruling class uh, uh, in that in, in, in that kind of like, uh, yeah, like, like, I think there's like a kind of like suppressed, this is just my, my, yeah. my sort of interpretation, um, a kind of like suppressed bourgeois revolution that is like still uh, 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 sort of simmering in, in, in Central Europe, especially in like, and I feel like in the United States, like, I, I I've heard this argument elsewhere, like that, like there is a, a dynamism to to the society that doesn't allow for that kind of um, uh, I don't know I don't know like like I don't if you look at the at the at the at the aughts and, and teens in Europe, it like it like the senses of a much like it's like this pressure cooker of, of like social discontent in a way that I that I don't sense uh, the same way in America, but. That might be just impressionistic, you know. No, so so what you're saying is actually a fixture of the liberal and especially the Cold War liberal mm -hmm. historiography of the Socialist Party of America. Um, this this notion that well, the European autocracies only needed mass socialist parties, and therefore those parties were only able to provoke a revolutionary situation in many cases because they hadn't yet gotten liberal democracy, right? Whereas in the United States, we had it, and that's why socialism failed here, right? That's the premise of the liberal historiography. Um, I think there are reasons to think that that is not quite right. Um, and, and not only, not, not only, I mean, of course, the Marxists here did not think that was right, but why? And I think their reasons were fairly compelling. Um, they thought that actually in the post-Civil War United States, the promise of bourgeois democratic revolution, the promise of a free and equal bourgeois democratic society was being just constantly betrayed, right? Um, was just being thoroughly and massively unmet um, in almost every realm of social and political life. Um, some of the most egregious examples come to mind. You know, there's a book called Worse Than Slavery that is about how um, in many cases in the South, um, black Americans could be basically, you know, convicted on very petty crimes and put into prison labor gangs, the chain gangs. And this was not, you know, this was not uh, unusual. This was like a fairly regular feature. If you're familiar with the um, TV show, I like it. Um, oh, I'm blanking on the name now. Boardwalk Empire. Um, it, it depicts, if you read this book that I referenced about uh, the sewer socialists that I referenced, you'll picture that TV show because Milwaukee of all places, just every possible kind of graft and corruption. And that's just what cities were. I mean, that's what the Republican Party, not to mention the Democratic Party of this time, had just become. Like, like every city was just a massive boondoggle of corruption and graft in every possible way. You know, and so, so what about your bourgeois revolution, right? You know, that's, that's what a lot of people were asking. Um, and, you know, of course, then the labor movement, right? Like the Knights of Labor and, uh, you know, the, the Haymarket uh, affair and the rise of populism. You see uh, a sort of decades long cycling through of just a whole host of discontents, whether agrarian or urban, um, whether in extractive industries out west, the wild west, um, or, you know, closer to closer to the settled east. Um, there's just a just a huge variety of discontents that, that people have in the society. And so um, I guess the answer, I think, from the socialists, but I also think this is very compelling, is that almost everywhere you look, 
you know, in any realm of life, you just see a betrayal of those bourgeois revolutionary democratic ideals um, in this country. And so um, that's how I think they would respond. Um, they felt like the field was open and actually in some ways it really was, you know, to them as, as evidenced by the range of their activity. Let me pass out a few more books um, just to, you know, one of which demonstrates that. Um, any, yeah, back there. Um, yeah. I was just wondering if you could uh, clarify like, what exactly happened where the Milwaukee solution wasn't as effective as it was presumed to be. Or like how they, how, as effective as they wanted. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my understanding is at this point, um, the trade union movement, like like the kind of premise of the Milwaukee idea, I think they ba like Berger basically said there's a workers movement, and it has two arms or two legs, and one is the the unions and one is the party, and so you know they might not always. It's not one leg, it's two, right? They might have separate movement, but they're going in the same direction, right? Like the premise is your two legs will walk in the same direction, may not always do so at the same time or in the same way, right? But they're, they're sort of aligned. And Berger thought if you only take socialists, you know, these are German Marxists. These are, these are people who themselves or maybe their parents came to settle in Wisconsin after the revolutions of 1848, right? When, as, as Marco's question alluded to, the bourgeois democratic revolution in Germany is stifled. And so they say, we're gonna to go to the freest country, the United States. Many of them were Marxists or social, socialists. Many of them fought in the American Civil War, or many of them came after the um, Franco-Prussian War. They didn't like the politics of, of Bismarck in Germany. So these are socialists. These are Marxists in many cases. And Berger sort of thinks that if we just have them take leadership positions in the party, like this electoral party, and take leadership positions in this labor movement, then we're going to have a kind of directorate. Some have, some have argued that the conception here was like very firm and disciplined, almost dictatorial, right? Of like, then we're going to be able to give everyone orders. Others argue that it was more of like a flexible arrangement. But what happens in time, I think the crucial thing to understand with the rise of progressivism is that as labor becomes more and more organized, and especially as it pushes forward its discontents, demands for reform, and especially insofar as the Socialist Party becomes a vehicle for this, the capitalist parties, and especially the progressives, start catching on. And they say, you know, we can do something with this politically. Now, the socialists don't have any inroads with the capitalist state. You know, they don't have state power. But of course, the progressives do, or they might or if they join the Democratic or Republican parties, they might, right? And so it becomes easier for them over time to create a legislative climate, to create, to create a regulatory climate where it will be in the interests of the, the union bureaucracy to sort of betray, not follow the orders of the Socialist Party. So if the Socialist Party says we don't support the war, it might nevertheless be in the interest of a union to say, well, um, we're going to serve on the War Industries Board. A union bureaucrat may say, well, I want to serve on the War Industries Board because then my workers are going to get a 5% pay increase. You know, that's, these things become compelling. And so um, I think that's maybe a very simple way of answering or starting to answer, but they end up just pulling in different directions because, because they have different interests and lacking a kind of um, more of a firm party discipline and a commitment to a vision of not allowing that to happen, I think even the more revolutionary-minded socialists in Wisconsin, um, and you could maybe very, very broadly put Victor Berger in that category, I think he shared the same end goals, um, found themselves not able to, to really combat that. Um, I think in the very broad view, that would be one way of looking at it. But that Ronald Radosh book that I mentioned is very good on this, especially vis-a-vis -vis the First World War. And that's when things really come to a climax. Um, in terms of just total integration of the labor movement in the state that kind of sidelines the Socialist Party. Um, yeah. Um, I was looking at the Socialist Party platform of, of 1912 and looking at some of their demands, and I was thinking I'd maybe read some of them, and I was kind of curious yeah. to hear your thoughts on, on where these demands Went because you don't yeah. hear these demands made by socialists, communists, uh, I don't know, after this 
So the, um, the abolition of the Senate and the veto power of the president, the election of the president and vice president by direct vote of the people, the abolition of the power usurped by the Supreme Court of the United States, um, abolition of the present restrictions upon the amendment of the Constitution, uh, so that the instrument may be made amenable by a majority of the voters and the majority of the states, the granting of the right of suffrage in the District of Columbia, of representation in Congress and a democratic form of municipal government, the extension of democratic government to all United States territories. Um, so, I mean, these are just eminently kind of Republican demands in a way. Sure. But you don't hear these. If someone were to say these are the demands of a socialist party, you might say, huh? You know, these don't sound like the demands of a socialist party. So I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I appreciate that. That's a great question. Um, you know, I would say in very broad terms, I, I would fit that theoretically into sort of what I laid out, you know, closer to the start, that that the Marxian socialists recognize that it's fallen to the working class to advocate for purely bourgeois democratic demands, right? That and and again, this is a system where you know the, the capitalist parties are just massively corrupt. Um, now, in part because of this, I should say, the socialists of this time are sort of savvy in that, um, or at least some of them are, in, in arguing that even if we advocate for a reform and then we win it, if we can't make good on it politically, then we have to understand that the reform as such is not the end goal, right? Um, and so they, they uh, certainly champion these reforms. In many cases, progressive capitalism the parties and politicians of progressive capitalism ended up actually delivering these reforms. Some of them, you know, came through at earlier times than others. For example, I, I could be wrong, um, I, but I believe implied in one of the texts that I was reading is actually there was a time when there was not direct election of U.S. senators. Does anyone know this? Is that true? Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah they were, um, yeah, they were, there was representatives like who would then select that. One of the constitutional yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I think this may have varied state by state. I'm not sure because I'm not sure otherwise how Berger would have gotten elected. I, I don't know. Um, but yes, yeah, so so certainly they championed all of these causes. Um, and, I, and I agree with you. You know, you could see it as a taking up of a Republican, broadly Republican politics. Um, but they were very careful to note that, you know, the they might not necessarily be the beneficiaries of those reforms. And I think they were in particular interested in championing reforms that they themselves could become a beneficiary of. Um, you know, for example, if they, they change the rules on how a senator is elected and then are able to put up candidates for Senate and then get elected, and then they use the Senate to popularize, to educate, to spread consciousness, to spread ideas about socialism, that would be sort of a way that I think in the classical Marxist approach, you could see the, the reform fitting into a revolutionary strategy, right? Um, but yeah, I think those are, that's a great question. Yeah. So, um, this is a broad question, but like, was Deb's goal to have a sort of like Napoleonic dictatorship of the US? Like, was that his end goal? Like if he could have complete control? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. My understanding, of the term dictatorship is that they viewed it as a kind of transitory, temporary state, almost like a civil war. Um, and I think Deb, in Debs's vision, um, the Socialist Party is able to organize so much of society. And this is very, this is very hard for us to understand or envision. Um, but again, if you think about, you know, I'm actually going to pass around this book. This is about what they organized in, in, in Germany. If you think about the really broad civil society that they were trying to organize at this time, the idea was that if the socialists just kept organizing, kept educating and organizing, then more and more unions, more and more voluntary associations, more and more ethnic clubs, more and more churches, more and more farmers cooperatives, you name it, anything and everything out there in civil society would become organized and led in or around the party. So eventually, at, at that point, you hold an election and much like the Republican Party in the 1850s, right? It's a, it's a kind of revolutionary party. Um, they, they have, you could say, an abolitionist program, right? The Republican Party of the 1850s. They say, we want to confiscate property in humans, 
right? They build a democratic coalition for this. And eventually they actually win. They, they, they do enough educating and organizing to actually win power. And what does that prompt? It prompts those who refuse to give up the politics of, of keeping property and human labor. It prompts them to become a counter-revolutionary force, right? So that's kind of how Debs and Berger thought about this. They thought, ideally, we will convince so many people so fully that almost no one or no one will take up arms against us, right? That was the vision. And in that case, maybe you have a, like a dictatorial situation, very little, you know, or, or not at all. But more likely, knowing how politics tends to fall out, it, it would be dictatorial in the way that Abraham Lincoln, for example, was dictatorial. You know, when you're prosecuting a civil war with a kind of abolitionist aim, there were times when Lincoln violated certain tenets of liberalism. It's not to justify it or to condemn it per se, but just to say that is a political feature of civil war, right? And so you could think of the dictatorship in that, in that broad sense. And I think they were very conscious of that. There's a whole book about this, actually, the way that Debs um, in particular took up kind of the memory and legacy of the civil war. But that was one of their greatest reference when they, uh, points of reference when they were when they were trying to decide, like trying to explain to people what their political strategy or political vision was. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, this is my question, but you mentioned Butter Jones at one point. Yeah. It's interesting how she has a left syndicalist, ultra leftist syndicalist critique of the SPA, and yet yeah. she swings all the way around to Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, that common or like what do you make of that? I'm glad you asked because I was hoping someone would pick up on that because I think it's a very interesting trajectory um, in the sense that, you know, if, if you're purely a laborist, even if you're a very radical or militant laborist, if your political horizon and vision is nothing other than maximum organization and maximum representation of the rights of organized labor, that doesn't mean necessarily at all that you fit in with a socialist party politics, right? That is actually after the dictatorship of the proletariat, that is after socialist governing political power. If a capitalist party or politician comes along and says, well, yes, please, like organize labor on an industry-wide basis, absolutely, and have maximal representation for it, um, if you think you can get a better deal from them, and maybe you can you know, in the circumstances she did, um, you might go with that politics instead. Um, and actually there were a few other figures that could be mentioned, right? You almost see a prototypical version of the Democrats' New Deal coalition that becomes its McGovernite social movement coalition of racial and ethnic minorities and women and organized labor, right? Because there's Mother Jones who, who kind of takes this, who, who sort of, has this road to progressivism from a socialist point of view. There's W.E.B. Du Bois, who actually ends up supporting Wilson as well, kind of for a similar reason. He thinks, you know, initially he's a member of the Socialist Party, he is for some time, and then he thinks he'll get a better deal from Wilson and the Democrats. Um, there's also the case of um, I'm, Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger is involved in the Socialist Party for a while, and then eventually comes, her path is maybe to my mind, maybe somewhat less directly tied to the Wilson administration, but it's a similar idea that actually I'm really after this progressive reform agenda. What's important is control of birth, not control of you know, productive conditions, um, you know, to the point where she breaks with the party to pursue that kind of single issue. So you actually, what I wanted to draw out there, because I think the war can overshadow this so much, but what I wanted to draw out there is even before the war, you have what could be broadly termed as like progressivist defectors from, from the party and its politics. At the same time, you know, up to 1912, the party is growing. You know, so I don't want to say this is um, entirely representative, but nonetheless, these defectors become kind of indicative of some of the politics of the time. Um, yeah. Um, didn't the populist movement also kind of suffer this appropriation of platform demands as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. The, um, in 1896, the big debate in the Populist Party is whether to, to make the, the, the main issue the trusts or free silver, which I think involves some kind of like, um, I, some of you may know more about the economic dimensions of this than I do, but it was basically like some kind of um, 
monetary policy that was thought to be monetary policy reform that was thought to be favorable to small farmers and workers. And the, the party decided to go in the direction of free silver. Um, but then their candidate, William Jennings Bryan, ends up um, entering the Democratic Party. And um, interestingly, he um, I, I'm, I'm not really expert on what you just described, like kind of splits from, from populism. I know that the party, the Socialist Party manages to capture at least some populist remnants. Um, but Bryan ends up entering the Wilson administration in, I believe, 1912. And if I'm not mistaken, he actually leaves his post because he refuses to go along with the war in 1916. Because, of course, the populists, the progressives at this time, had more of a Teddy Roosevelt imperial policy, right, aligned with the trusts. And the populists were more critical of the trusts, and they were critical of, you know, you could say they were like, I think to some degree at least, they were like old-time Jeffersonian Democrats, right? Democratic, Republican, Jeffersonians of the old variety, and they wanted constitutional small government and non-interference with you know, foreign wars and so on. And so um, there is a break. But yeah, the Democratic Party um, does manage to capture a lot of remnants of, of populism as well. But it's kind of an uneasy coalition, as, as the example of Brian, I think, indicates. How do we feel about taking a break and then those who have interest and will can remain and I will read the second half of what I had prepared for you all. Does that sound good? Um, okay. Maybe we'll regroup at uh, 7.33. Does that sound okay? Um, so I want to start us off um, maybe again just in a bit of a conversational register for a minute or two here because um, partly I uh, asked... Uh, folks here to play the Bernie Sanders documentary uh, because I got caught in traffic and was running a few minutes late. But partly, I wanted you to actually see how, for example, Bernie Sanders takes up the legacy and history of Eugene Debs and Debsian socialism. And I want you to think about what are the lessons that Bernie Sanders wants you to draw? What does he want you to know about Debs and the party Debs led? And what are the political upshots, right, for Bernie Sanders? Um, just briefly, could anyone tell me, like, what are some things that stood out? Maybe you've, you've watched that documentary. Maybe you've heard him speak at other times about Debs. What's the point of Debs for, for Sanders? Um, one line, I, I admittedly wasn't listening super closely, but one line that I perked up at was where Bernie Sanders, in his sort of heavy Northeast accent, was talking about like the abolition of wages and all other forms of oppression. And more than anything, the thought that sort of occurred to me is like, that doesn't really sound like 2016, 2020 Bernie Sanders. Sure. Right. Right. Absolutely. No. Um, it doesn't. Yeah. Um. I mean, I, I can't remember. I watched all of it a while ago, but he portrays as like a moral hero. Yes. Oh, so his, yes. His moral stature. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Sanders said, not that long ago, he might have said it a but he said, yes, said, like 2016, when he, you know, when he got the president, um, like his heroes are Debs and MLK, and um, I don't even know, Freud, I don't realize. <laughs> but then, like, just you compare Debs and MLK. So it's like a moral, mm -hmm. moral leadership. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think you also see there the notion of like an interest group brokerage politics, right? Like someone who serves as a spokesperson for an interest group or constituency in society vis-a-vis -vis the capitalist state, often integrated into the Democratic Party under the mantle of like a social movement, right? So we have labor, that's a social movement, and we have black Americans, and that's a social movement, women, and you know, et cetera, right? Like that's kind of the model of the Democratic Party that you see taking incipient shape in the Wilson era, as I've talked about, and it kind of reaches a certain full flowering in the New Deal, and then another kind of rebranding in um, the 19, late 60s and early 70s around the McGovern campaign which I'll mention in a few minutes, but um, yeah, exactly. So it's a kind of like moral hero who performs the political role of like interest group brokerage in the context of capitalist politics, perhaps 
you know, brokering the discontents and aspirations of a social movement. Um, yeah, that's the idea. Any other thoughts? What do you think Bernie Sanders wants you to know about Debs? <laughs> What's the point of Debs for Bernie Sanders? Well, maybe that about covers it. So, um, so for the remainder of the talk, um, I want to switch registers in order to explore the following question. How has the history and legacy of Debsian socialism appeared in the historical consciousness of the left over the course of the center, century of counter-revolution that, from a Marxist perspective at least, has followed ever since the failure and defeat of the World Revolution 100 years ago? Right? So if we're living after a century from a Marxist perspective of counter-revolution after the failure of the World Revolution, how has the left, how differing perspectives on the left throughout that century look back, look back to the legacy of Debs and Debsian socialism? Why have they looked back in the first place? And what lessons have they drawn politically and why? That's what I want to start to sketch out. Um, admittedly, this part is a little bit less um, tightly established, but I am going to throw a lot out there that I, I hope you'll find interesting. Because I actually think in some ways this part is no less interesting than, than what I presented previously. So I'll begin in 1928 when the SPA's Rand School of Social Science, that was actually a school that the SPA operated, published a book by Nathan Fine titled Labor and Farmer Parties in the United States, 1828 to 1928. You can Google that. It's on Internet Archive, Labor and Farmer Parties in the United States. By that year, Eugene Debs was two years deceased, 1928, and the SPA's mass Debsian character had ceased to exist for nearly a decade. In its drift from Marxian socialism to reformist social democracy, the 1920s SPA pursued electoral coalitions with populist progressive farmer labor third parties. This is what happened in the wake of the socialist communist split. Incidentally, the communists to a large degree did this as well. Thus, the very scope of Fine's book can itself be read as a symptom of the SPA's late 1920s third partyist outlook. Fine narrates the SPA's development as a simultaneously electoral and civil social party. He treats its factional disputes with even-handedness, and he links Debsian socialism's ter terminal 1919 crisis to the broader fate of the second and third internationals in the context of capitalist war and world revolution. Now, perhaps precisely for this reason, Fine's penultimate paragraph carries bitter implications for the future of Marxism in America. Fine writes, our interest is in the American scene. Only as we really know the American scene will those of us who favor, favor a labor farmer progressive party win our battles. Facts about other lands may be suggestive and even vital, but they cannot be considered decisive. Theories worked out on the basis of conditions in other countries may likewise be very helpful, but they must be considered of secondary importance unless it is shown that they work in the United States. Theories evolved out of older situations, whether abroad or in this country, must also be taken with reserve and skepticism. Because so much is at stake, we can afford to bend backward in not overstating the factors in our favor, nor understating the forces against us. This is fine writing in 1928. Socialist Party member after the Debsian era. Um, presumably, those very final lines are directed against the left-wing and Marxist factions of the SPA, which joined the Third International after 1919 in anticipation of the revolution in the United States that never came. Right? So Fine's political vantage point of farmer labor, populist, progressive, third partyism owes much to the peculiar political circumstances of the 1920s prior to the complete and total triumph of progressive state capitalist integration that was the Democratic Party's New Deal coalition. Right, so there's this kind of interregnum where you have the incipient triumph of progressive state capitalism and the Wilson administration, the war, but then there's a bit of a loosening period during the 20s before that same politics is essentially rebooted with a vengeance in the New Deal and the Second World War. Now on the other side of that political watershed, after the New Deal, after the ever more firm integration of labor and virtually all societal forces into the capitalist state, um, in 1948, the Communist Party's International Publishers Press published a book-length retrospective reflection on Eugene Debs. And I'll pass it around if anyone wants to see. Um, now, it was during precisely this year, 1948, that the CP lent heavy support 
to the third party progressive candidacy of FDR's former vice president, Henry Wallace, in what ended up being the last gasp of the Communist Party's popular front strategy. Um, would you mind passing that around? Thank you. Um, the authors of the CP published book, Maurice and Kahn, described Debs' motivations for founding the SPA as follows. So I want you to think about this. This is their account of why Debs did what he did. In light of what I presented about Debs and his grounding in Marxism, consider what the CP described his motivations to be during their popular front period. They wrote, convinced that both major parties represented big business, Debs sought to rally support for a third party which would represent the urgent, urgent needs of the common people. This explains why Debs supported the People's Party of the 1890s and why he later played a leading role in the Socialist Party. Like progressive-minded people later on, Debs saw a third party movement or independent political action as urgently needed and in line with the best traditions of American freedom. Now, I may be making too much of very slight differentiations in, in wording here, but I think it's significant, right, that they they basically present Debs's, they don't really talk about the significance of Debs's conversion to Marxism, which is very significant in Debs's own mind. He refused to stand as the Populist Party's presidential candidate in 1896. This is in um, Ray Ginger's biography of Debs, um, The Bending Cross, which is a, a useful book. Um, Debs actually refused to stand for Populist Party presidential candidacy in 1896, because Berger had, um, as people would now say, red-pilled him on, on Marxism, right? Um, but here, it's, it's just one train. Debs just wanted just interest group representation of the people in third parties, right? And so that's kind of how you see the, the, the Communist Party's popular front understanding at this period. Um, after summarizing the progressive reforms Deb, Debs witnessed during his lifetime, the authors conclude by celebrating the, quote, powerful militant industrial unions of the 1930s, the, quote, important gains in the direction of social security, old age pensions, unemployment insurance, and a shorter workday, and the, quote, unquote, forward steps in the democratic rights of workers, women, Negroes, and national minority groups, end quote. Debs's real legacy, they imply, is to be found in the Democratic Party New Deal coalition. Here we see the basic script for all subsequent assessments of Debsian socialism that stem from a popular front viewpoint, whether that popular front viewpoint takes a Stalinist form, as in the Communist Party of the 1930s or 1948, or whether that popular front viewpoint takes a democratic socialist form, as in the DSA. The year 1952, and Bernie Sanders, I should mention, the year 1952 witnessed the publication of two books bearing all of the historiographical markings of the Cold War. One was Daniel Bell's Marxian Socialism in the United States, and the other was Ira Kipnis's The American Socialist Movement, 1897 to 1912, which I'm passing this around. Um, Daniel Bell approached Debsian Socialism as an anti-communist social democrat, who was also a recently disillusioned former member of the rump, politically marginal, Norman Thomas-led Socialist Party of America as of the 1940s, right? So, so, so Daniel Bell, I think actually here in Chicago, he had actually been um, studying with the Frankfurt School, had been um, actually involved working with them in some capacity. He actually uh, helped to organize, I believe, the Socialist Parties of, of America's, might have been their 1948 convention. I think it was actually here in Chicago. He comes away very disillusioned by the terrible electoral showing of the Socialist Party by that point. Um, this is under the leadership of Norman Thomas by the late 1940s. And he's trying to understand what happened to socialism, to Marxism in the United States. Um, now, Bell, so, so, so what viewpoint, what politics does he use to interpret that history, right? Well, Bell judges the Socialist Party of America's extremely poor post-World War II electoral showings against the comparative electoral success of the British Labor Party. For Bell, Debsian socialism failed insofar as the Socialist Party of America, unlike the Labor Party, failed to evolve into a junior partner in capitalist governance, capable of brokering the sectional interest of organized labor. In other words, that, that kind of interest group representation model that I just described, that's actually what Bell wanted the Socialist Party to have become. And so he, he held it against that standard and argued that it should have become that. Other socialist parties had elsewhere in the world, like the British Labor Party, and, and there was no such party in the United States. And for Bell, that was a problem. Um, 
Only if it had abandoned its Marxist quote unquote purism, Bell suggests, and only had it followed Samuel Gompers and Gompers' craft unions in support of Woodrow Wilson's war effort, could the Socialist Party of America have avoided the fate of becoming eclipsed by Democratic Party progressivism after 1912. And he may actually have a point there, but the political implications of that you know, will obviously depend on your, your perspective. Um, now, Ira Kipnis. Uh, Ira Kipnis, interestingly, likewise dates the Socialist, Parties of America, the Socialist Party of America's terminal decline to the year 1912. But for Kipnis, it's for the opposite reason. It's in that year that the party uh, recalled Big Bill Haywood from, the nation, from its National Executive Committee because Haywood had um, reportedly advocated industrial sabotage. And subsequently, there was an exodus of the IWW-affiliated faction, the kind of industrial unionist and sometimes syndicalist faction, out of the Socialist Party of America after 1912. So here we have to keep in mind the convergence of Kipnis's interpretation with that of the post-popular front Stalin-era Communist Party USA. Because in the decades after the 1919 socialist-communist split, um, this industrial unionist constituency of the labor movement gravitated towards the CPUSA, whose labor organizers eventually led its numerous unionists into the New Deal era Democratic Party following the Popular Front strategy, as I mentioned. So in doing so, the CPUSA abandoned the political independence that had once been maintained even by right-wing SPA leaders like Morris Hillquit and Victor Berger, whom Kipnis vilifies, right? So Kipnis is writing from the vantage point of Stalinism, but not the Popular Front Stalinism, a more um, uh, a Stalinism that viewed um, progressive liberalism much more um, in a much more hostile way. Um, so Kipnis leaves unaddressed the reformist ends to which the CPUSA later led its labor constituency. And by ending his account of the SPA in 1912, he sidesteps Hillquit and Berger's stated, at least, opposition to the First World War. Um, so his polemic against Hillquit and Berger, against the SPA right wing, gains a lot of plausibility because he, he ends his account there. Um, but despite these limitations, Kipnis's account remains the essential expression of the prevailing so-called Leninist interpretation of Debsian socialism that was authored by those who retrospectively identified with the communist side of the 1919 socialist communist split. And that actually includes um, uh, communists and Stalinists and Trotskyists. And Kipnis's book remains useful as a register of all of the reformist tendencies within Debsian socialism, or at least many of them. Now, um, as I sort of just alluded to, um, with the exception of the Moray Simkhan book um, that it is going around that is written from a popular front Stalinist perspective, um, Stalinist and Trotskyist historians have generally lionized the SPA's industrial unionist wing because it organized unskilled workers at the point of production, and they credit Eugene Debs for his revolutionary politics. At the same time, the Stalinist and Trotskyist uh, historians and intellectuals take the looseness of the SPA's organizational model. Remember, it was a national party with highly autonomous state sections, which harbored significant revisionist Marxist, reformist, and electoralist tendencies um, alongside the preferred industrial unionist tendencies, right? Um, the Stalinists and Trotskyists took the looseness of the SPA's organizational model to justify an ideologically and strategically disciplined revolutionary Marxist party as an alternative model. So this became known as a Leninist party model. It was initially premised on a Marxist assessment of the need to break with the reformist socialists to politically lead the world revolution. And it persisted after Lenin's death in 1924. Um, and this Leninist party model descends from the criteria established for parties affiliated with the Third International in its early Congresses. And then the Trotsky-led Fourth International also laid claim to those criteria for parties, right? So there's a difference here of, of what, what, should, what should socialists and Marxists in the United States pursue or try to build or maintain as a model of their political party for revolutionary socialism, right? And that difference sort of divides the Stalinists and Trotskyists on the one side, and then um, the actual model that was practiced by the Socialist Party of America uh, on the other side. Um, so another leading uh, Communist Party figure, William Z. Foster, um, articulates the similar criticisms, a criticism similar to Kipnis um, in his uh, History of the Communist Party of the United States that's published in 1952. Now, interestingly, um, 
despite their serious political differences on other matters. A leading American Trotskyist named James P. Cannon actually shared with Kipnis and Foster this sort of Leninist critique of the Debsian party model. And you can see that in the opening essay of this book, which actually I believe appears in the Sanders documentary. It's a book, book worth um, reading. Um, and Cannon's opening essay is titled E.V. Debs, the Socialist Movement of His Time, Its Meaning for Today. Um, so this is the conclusion of Cannon's opening essay to this book. I mean, I'll, I'll pass it around. Um, Cannon writes, the Bolshevik party of Lenin rightly became the model for the revolutionary workers in all countries, including this country, including the United States. The launching of the Communist Party in 1919 represented not simply a break with the whole conception of a common party of revolutionists and opportunists. That signified a new beginning for American socialism, far more important historically than everything that had happened before, including the organization of the Socialist Party in 1901. There can be no return, Cannon writes, to the outlived and discredited experiment of the past. The struggle against the crimes and betrayals of Stalinism, which is the prerequisite for the construction of an honest revolutionary party, requires weapons of a dis different arsenal. There can be no return to the past of the American movement. In connection, Cannon writes, with the 1956 Debs Centennial, some charlatans who measure the worth of a socialist movement by its numerical strength at the moment have discovered new virtues in the old Socialist Party, which polled so many votes at the time of Debs. And they have recommended a new experiment on the same lines. Besides its worthlessness as advice to the Socialist vanguard of the present day, that prescription does an injustice to the memory of Debs. The triumph of the cause Debs served so magnificently will require a different political instrument, a different kind of party than the one Debs supported. That the model for that is the party of Lenin. So that's what Cannon is writing, major figure of relatively orthodox American Trotskyism as of 1956, during the year, interestingly, of um, Eugene Debs's, the, the, the centennial of Eugene Debs's birth. Now, in a coincidence of history, the year 1956 was to mark not only the centennial of Debs's birth, it was also the very year during which the Khrushchev speech and the Soviet invasion of Hungary were to throw the communist parties across the world, including the CPUSA, into a state of internal crisis and political re-examination. If there's really one sort of singular and decisive moment that marks the new left, that makes the new left new, many, many things could be named in, in that category, but by far one of the most important, right, is the Khrushchev speech and the shaking up of communist parties throughout the world, including here in the US on, on that basis. Um, it was during this year that a wide range of leftist intellectuals, Stalinists and ex-Stalinists, Trotskyists and ex-Trotskyists began seeking to rehabilitate the very same multi-tendency, multi-strategy mass socialist party model that many Stalinists and Trotskyists had long condemned. These, what I would call neo-Debsian approaches, um, and perhaps they could even be called neo-Kautskyan, although I don't really think, to my knowledge, they understood themselves as such. Um, these approaches took shape during the early New Left period, and they aimed to overcome a real problem, which was that the um, Stalinist and Trotskyist organizations of that time had become ideologically and organizationally rigid. They had largely fallen into a kind of sectarianism, right? That was a real problem. That's not leading to the revolution. So in that sense, it's conservative, right? So, so there is an attempt to break beyond the conservatism of the sectarian model of these Stalinist and Trotskyist organizations. But to try to do that, they turn to the history and legacy of the model of the Debs-led Socialist Party of America. So during the 1955 to 57 crisis years of Stalinism, um, communists and ex-communists published reconsiderations of Debsian socialism in communist or communist adjacent journals, such as Political Affairs and Monthly Review. And if I had more time, I'd actually love to share with you, there are a lot of interesting primary sources. If anyone is really curious, I can show you where to look at these. But it's really interesting. You see a proliferation 
of reconsiderations and kind of exchanges in a wide range of journals across a lot of political currents at this moment. Very unusual, actually, on the American left from about 1955, but especially in 56 and 57. And they're all eyeing the possibility of forging a broad left unity party in the wake of McCarthyism. So within a few years of that, the ex-communist historian James Weinstein began publishing reappraisals of Debsian socialism in the American New Left journal, Studies on the Left. This is one of the major journals that I think was published out of Madison, Wisconsin, of, of the New Left, and especially the campus and student academic New Left. And this culminated in his major, Weinstein's major revisionist history of the Socialist Party of America, The Decline of Socialism in America, 1912 to 25, published in 1967. Now, this book may represent the single greatest revision in the entire historiography of Debsian socialism. Why? Well, Weinstein depicts that period of 1912 to 1917 not as a period of decline and loss. Daniel Bell had said that was a period of decline and loss for the party because everyone, or at least many members, uh, left the party in, to, to join Wilsonian progressivism. I've discussed that, right? But remember the communists, so, so Daniel Bell's saying that from a social democratic point of view, but remember the communist, Ira Kipnis, also has a declension narrative post 1912, right? Because he says that in 1912, Big Bill Haywood and the industrial unionist and quasi syndicalist faction leave the party in, in protest um, of the censure on Haywood. Um, and so, so both the communists and the social democrats see everything as going downhill after 1912. But Wilson says no. And I actually think he has a point here. Um, because uh, Weinstein sees this post-1912 as a period of, of broad consolidation for the party. Um, one reason I think Weinstein has a point is that he emphasizes something specifically political, right? That, that the Socialist Party of America wasn't just about representing unions whether it's the conservative unions of the AFL that the social Democrat like Daniel Bell prized, or whether it's more the industrial unions like around the IWW that the communists like Ira Kipnis prized, right? What Weinstein says is actually after 1912, the party succeeds in part because it takes up a specifically political demand, right? It, it doesn't have to be about unions. It can be about politics. Again, going back to an earlier question, republicanism, if you will, or democratic bourgeois demands, namely the war, right? So what does it mean to say that it's actually significant that the Socialist Party of America opposed the war? Is that actually capturing a very profound um, political, specifically political demand? What more political act could there be than a war? And so what more incipiently revolutionary position for a party to take, you know, could there be than to actually publicly and fairly uniformly, with some exceptions as we've discussed, actually try to oppose that war um, and organize against it or in protest of it, right? So Weinstein sees this, and I think it's an important point. Lenin, obviously, during, this, during that historical period, also recognized the importance of a specifically political opposition to the war, even if this had you know, seemingly, at first glance at least, less to do with trade union politics, right? Um, be it industrial unionist or craft unionist. Um, so um, Weinstein argues that um, the SPA actually, even though it lost, um, it lost some members who became pro-war collectivist socialists, right? These Wilsonian socialists who left the party um, because the party was anti-war. Nonetheless, the party actually gained a lot of members because it was the party of opposition to the war, right? So for, for Weinstein, that's significant. Um, and Weinstein argues that this led to the first of two fatal political blows that the party suffered. Um, the uh, One was, of course, the, the Wilsonian terror, and then the other was the splitting of international socialism. And Weinstein thinks that the the 1919 socialist communist split was ultimately um, transplanted in a kind of Procrustean fashion onto the factional divides internal to the SPA. He thinks there's this split in international socialism, but it doesn't really fit. It's really not appropriate to the American party of the Second International. So again, we could you know debate both sides of that, but that's that's where Weinstein's coming from. So for Weinstein. This resulted in a politically unprincipled sectarianism as early as the 1920s, the early 1920s, 
among American leftists that persisted in Weinstein's view well into the era of the new left. So Weinstein looks back and says, well, what legacy are we living with from the Socialist Party of America? Well, we're living with the legacy of the 1919 socialist communist split because since then, no organization on the left has really overcome sectarianism. And if it has, it's only been through like an opportunist popular front coalition with Democratic Party, New Deal, progressive capitalism, right? So that's kind of Weinstein's diagnosis. That's his point. Um, now, now it kind of gets interesting. Um, what does Weinstein do? Um, well, Christopher Lash, some of you may know um, the intellectual Christopher Lash, actually reviewed Weinstein's book in the context of a project that they undertook together for many years um, alongside the ex-communist historian Eugene Genovese, who was heavily influenced in this period by Antonio Gramsci. They all and many others um, on the New Left collaborated in a project to reestablish a Debsian Socialist Party in the United States. Christopher Lash actually devoted about a year of his life to touring and speaking in favor of this outcome, right? So they were actually pretty serious about it. So around 1968. Um, Lash's very widely read review of Weinstein's book that's being passed around appears in the 1969 book, The Agony of the American Left, which some of you may be familiar with. Now, James Weinstein upheld the Debs era SPA as a political model as late as his 1975 book, Ambiguous Legacy, The Left in American Politics. Um, by no later than 1976, however, Weinstein had joined the New America Movement. This was founded, I believe, in the late 60s, early 70s out of the New Left. And he edited the Chicago-based magazine In These Times, which he envisioned as a slightly more left-wing complement to Dissent Magazine, which was the magazine of Michael Harrington's Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee. So interestingly, even though they're coming from different places, right? Michael Harrington um, coming from the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee as of the early 70s, James Weinstein coming from the New America Movement. By 1982, they actually converged politically with the merger of the New America Movement and DSOC to form what we now know as the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and so by then, they were committed to a popular front strategy of organizing um, and electoral work in and around the social movement coalition that was based on the 1972 Democratic Party presidential candidacy of George McGovern. And George McGovern's personal hero was Henry Wallace. So you see here, there's kind of this interesting moment on the new left of like a neo debsian revival. These leftists are thinking, how can we break out of organizational sectarianism? Let's recover the history of the Debs-led Socialist Party of America. Maybe we need to go back to that model. And in this case, they kind of try. Some historians have argued that, and I've looked at the sources and I think this is plausible, that Gramsci had a lot to do with why maybe they failed to take hold because they had this notion of organizing almost singularly among intellectuals and academics for counter-hegemonic cultural purposes and so on. Um, I, I hate but, to interrupt. Do you mean, do you mean that Gramsci like the, the sort of Gramscian thought prevented the sort of Debsian idea from culminating into anything meaningful, like they conflicted or, or what? Yes, I think that's a plausible interpretation. Um, it's tricky because getting a Debs model mass socialist party off the ground would be difficult no matter what. So it's, it's, it's a bit tenuous. It's a bit you know dicey to claim, well, if only they hadn't read so much Gramsci, we'd have a socialist party today. But... Um, when you look at, there, there's actually a recently published PhD dissertation on this that's very good. Um, and I've looked at the sources myself for another paper, and it really does seem like that model kind of worked what they thought they had to do, right? It, it turned it into a very, um, you can almost see the fragmentary pieces, I thought, of, it, uh, I guess the analogy was they couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again, right? Because did the old Socialist Party have intellectuals who took ideology very seriously? Yes. Like, did they have activists who did um, kind of countercultural social, civil social organizing? Yes. Um, they had those elements, but I think um, they weren't able to really bring them together and they kind of came apart. Another element, of course, was running in elections, and I didn't mentioned here, but Weinstein had done a bit of that as well. So they were sort of doing all of the things that the old party had done, but they were doing them in a kind of disparate way. And I think ultimately they ended up favoring 
the proselytization of socialist ideas among a kind of campus intellectualized milieu, um, which may be just fine. And, and it's some of their more um, sober moments. I think they thought of themselves as just creating an intellectual center. Um, the Marxist Hal Draper comes around with this idea as well um, in, in, in the wake of the new left, like kind of just a center where people could could sort of explore and share socialist ideas and education. That was maybe a more plausible and sober model for what they were doing, but they thought of themselves as like legitimately, seriously founding a mass socialist party on the Debsian model. And that they totally failed to do. They never really even got it off the ground. Um, they held a lot of meetings and you know they gave a lot of talks and wrote actually some very interesting pieces of history, um, but were not able to really accomplish the, the task. Um, now, the other part of the story is as follows. Parallel neo debsian thinking actually manifested among ex-Trotskyists during Stalinism's crisis years around 1956, as a wide range of organizers and intellectuals on the left considered the conditions of possibility for political rapprochement across these three broad categories, Stalinists, the old Social Democrats and the Socialist Party USA, and Trotskyists, right? There's this moment of possible rapprochement, ex-Trotskyists are taking in this. In 1957, as the ex-Trotskyist Max Schachmann led his Independent Socialist League to join the remaining members of the Norman Thomas-led Socialist Party of America, he simultaneously reevaluated, retrospectively, whether the 1919 socialist-communist split had been desirable at all. Right? So in this moment, he's actually reconsidering the very origins of the split as well. Um, and he praises the vitality of the Debs era SPA. And this is in a book review essay that you can look up. It's titled, American Communism, A Reexamination of the Past. And that's by Max Schachmann. So Schachmann begins by raising the legacy of Trotsky's 1936 French turn. It was in the French turn that Trotsky led his followers to enter the rump second international parties of their respective countries in France, obviously, but also here in the United States, which meant the SPA. So there was a brief period of time, I think it was about a year or two, mid-1930s, when Trotsky leads his followers actually into the Socialist Party of America that the communists and many future Trotskyists had left in 1919. So um, Shackman is looking back to that around 1957. And Shackman writes, quote, the quote unquote old position stoutly proclaimed to this day, think of canon, isolated and harmed the Trotskyist movement even more completely than the communist movement out of which it came. In 1936, it had its first real opportunity to break out of this isolation, to advance its ideas, and at the same time to build a broad socialist movement. It adopted the decision against fierce opposition of the quote-unquote Leninist sectarians in its ranks, in other words, in Trotskyism's ranks, to enter the Socialist Party. In the Socialist Party, it helped to realize some of these opportunities with remarkable success for the party as a whole and for its own ideas in particular. But the quote-unquote old position again, think of James Cannon, asserted itself in the end. It split from the SP, Trotskyism split from the SP in the late 1930s. Although the responsibility for that split is by no means a one-sided affair, both sides wanted it and worked for it and reconstituted an independent revolutionary sect. Right, so emphasis on sect. So that is Shackman's conclusion. What happened after the French turn? Well, actually the Trotskyists had a great opportunity to sort of grow in and around and with the, the old Socialist Party when they entered it in the 1930s. But this notion of a Leninist party model can't be in the same party with reformists that ruled out the Trotskyists left the Socialist Party, they abandoned the French turn strategy and they became, in Schachmann's view, a sect. So Schachmann concludes by implicitly advocating the creation of a quote, broad United Socialist Party. Right. So interesting to note at this time, you have both the ex-Stalinist, James Weinstein, and the ex-Trotskyist, um, Max Schachmann, who are trying to recover, questioning the 1919 socialist-communist split, trying to recover the legacy of a mass socialist party on the Debs model. Now, Hal Draper, a one-time Schachmannite I mentioned, refused to follow Schachmann when Schachmann, within a few years, led his cadres into the Democratic Party during the early 1960s. And from the vantage point of independent Socialist Party politics, 
Draper embraced the legacy of Debsian socialism in essays that were eventually published in a book called Socialism from Below. The contemporary historian Eric Thomas Chester, whom we've engaged in Platypus on our panel on free speech on the left, he lends historical depth to Draper's perspective on Debsian socialism in two books. One is titled Socialist and the Ballot Box, a Historical Analysis, and this characterizes the Debs era SPA as the single most viable historical model for Marxian socialist politics in the United States. Chester's other book is titled True Mission, Socialists and the Labor Party Question in the United States, published in 2004. And that book argues for the revival of a Debsian socialist party specifically as distinct from a labor party. Just want to point out there are some interesting remnants on the left um, of, of the way Draper um, sort of internalized and reinterpreted Schachtman's look back to the legacy of Debsian socialism. Uh, now, this is my final paragraph. Um, it's maybe implicitly a little bit polemical, and then we can talk. Um, if one views the reconsiderations of Debsian socialism undertaken by Weinstein and Schachtman during the early New Left period, in light of their eventual political trajectories, then the orthodox Trotskyist instincts of James P. Cannon would appear to be proven correct. Namely, it appears to be the case that any thought of rehabilitating the Kautskyan mass party model of Debsian socialism is but a way station on the path towards channeling American socialists into a popular front within or around the Democratic Party. Draper and Lash stand apart from this fate. Though, Draper's followers in the International Socialist Organization ended up effectively tailing the Democratic Party's progressive social movements during the neoliberal era. While Lash, Christopher Lash, in his late life turn towards conservatism, gestured towards the lost political potential of the proto-neoconservative constituency behind the populist Democratic Party candidacy of George Wallace. The left has failed to escape the gravitational pull of capitalist politics ever since the death of Debsian socialism. So what I want to point out there at the end is I think anyone who's undertaking a kind of neo-Debsian or neo-Kautskian revival um, from the new left into the present, unfortunately, has simply ended up proving all of the suspicions of the orthodox Trotskyists to be correct because they've ended up simply channeling that party and that politics back into the Democratic Party. I wish I could say it were otherwise, truly. Um, and I think there's actually a great deal of energy, and that's maybe not the word for it, but it's, it's sort of like a breakthrough intellectually and in terms of historical consciousness to read these writings by Draper or the Draperites or to read Weinstein in this recovery of Debsian socialism. It's actually very exciting because it promises an impasse, a way out of the impasse of, of organizational sectarianism that is deeply conservative, just as much as opportunism on the American left, right? So I, I want to encourage that impulse, but at the same time, the history of the new left shows us in a few varieties, it ends up back, back in progressive capitalist politics. So that's the nature of the situation. Um, as I see it, <laughs> a lot more could be said. Um, but questions, thoughts? Yeah. Um, right at the end, you had this line of a revival of neo debsian or neo kautskian politics. Um, basic question, I guess. Would you consider the two terms synonymous or coterminous? Um, you don't have to be super extensive about it, but like, if there is a difference, where is that sort of seen? Obviously, the historiography and like where how you consider them affects that interpretation. But like, yeah. like what what are the distinctions? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it has occurred to me. Some of you might be familiar with um, Lars Lee's book Lenin Rediscovered, um, and it puts Lenin's essay "What Is to Be Done" in context and basically reveals Lenin to have been following a Kautskyan strategy. And especially after doing research for this talk, I've sort of thought that someone can come out with uh, you know. Debs rediscovered, or the Socialist Party of America rediscovered, and kind of make a similar move because not all, but much of the historiography, unfortunately, um, treats the SPA as a little bit more indigenous than it was. I can understand that impulse 
that's there, there's something salutary about that impulse because a lot of the cold warriors and anti-communists wanted to say, oh, socialism, Marxism in America, that's nothing but a foreign import. And it never took hold on American soil because for the reasons Marco mentioned, and, and they're relevant, you know, they're, they're relevant factors in the um, history and historiography here. I didn't um, say that it didn't take roots. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not trying to throw you under the bus, Marco. But, but, but that notion, right? That like, well, we don't need that here, and so it was always a foreign transplant. So I think there's something salutary about um, recovering, uh, you know, to to use like a Browderism, I guess. Um, you know, like like Debsian socialism is American as apple pie. <laughs> like, you know, the inheritance of the Civil War, the way in which the bourgeois democratic promises of the United States above all other countries were being made a travesty of, like, and, and how the Socialist Party is actually addressing that. I think that that's, there was a usefulness to that move, but unfortunately it did sort of ghettoize or provincialize the history of the Socialist Party of America, right, by pulling it out of that. So yes, I think, I think in a lot of ways they could be read as simultaneous. I don't, um, you know, again, going back to Lenin, and Lenin, Lenin coming up with a shorthand for Debs as the American Babel, it's very close to saying the American Kautsky, um, at least before the mid 1900s, and then Kautskyism becomes more complicated in relation to Lenin. But um, yeah, I, I think they're probably loosely synonymous. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll be provocative and say, why wouldn't you consider the DSA as a step towards? the reconstitution of the Debsian party. Because after yeah. all, they, they became big, you know, now they have 100,000 members or something like that. Or, you know, and then, um, you know, they, they do socialist education, they have other magazines, right? They have all these young people reading it. Um, yeah. You know, Harrington got what he wanted. He, he got, you know, the left, you know, liberal, united them into an organization. Mm -hmm. So, even if it's not a Debsian party, couldn't it be a, a step towards the Debsian party with a broad mass industry, blah, blah, blah. Which is how people get disabled, except the diversity of the organization is a mass yeah. tendency, it's not dogmatic, um, kind of a pseudo Debsian um, mm -hmm. uh, desire, I guess. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you know, if I hadn't put all my money in crypto, I would have bet it on. The, uh, there being a major break within the DSA and the founding of an independent socialist political party. <laughs> you know, um, I, great, you know, if that happens. I mean, we'll see. I, I'm, I, I wouldn't bet on it. I wouldn't say that it's a very safe bet. Um, but if it happens, I would be very happy to be proven wrong. I mean, we truly do not know what will happen. Um, but the history, as I've seen it, suggests, and actually this is against my own strongly neo kautskian instincts, the history suggests that what is probably likely to happen is not that result. Um, if that does happen, I would probably join that party, actually. You know, I would remain a member of Platypus, but like I'm, you know, that would be great if someone actually did it. But I just, um, I personally don't really anticipate it. Now that said, I don't, I'm not very close to the situation, but I just feel like that basic logic um, tends to be very powerful in terms of keeping people actually within the orbit. It's always one month more, one year more, just around the corner, and then and then eventually, you know, it's just the vanished horizon of a goal that, you know, has been abandoned. So I, um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, I hope it happens. But I, I, again, I don't really think it will. Maybe Oscar Sankara is the American Babel. <laughs> the He's been in very deep cover, if that's the case. <laughs> very deep cover. Um, yeah. Okay, so to bring this into a sort of broader uh, context of where where socialism with the DSA and where our movement towards uh, our, our leftist movement occupies in our cultural space, right? Mm -hmm. Do you would you agree uh, with me in the statement that we're broadly repeating the same mistakes of the hippies in uh, a, mm. or, or sort of the failure at least of the hippies as a uh, political movement, right? It was very successful as, say, a lifestyle yeah. movement, right? And uh, it inspired a generation of all, uh, artists, et cetera, right? And if, but if we separate um, sort of their uh, 
their, their politics from their uh, from their from their cultural outfit, right? We see, say, um, the Grateful Dead sticker turn uh, on the Cadillac, right? Is that what's happening now, where we're going to see, say, the Bernie Sanders sticker on the Tesla instead? Like, do, you, yeah. do you see it as solely? Uh, do you see it as solely uh, cultural or uh, or otherwise? Yeah. Well, actually, the very premise of your question points to one of the most longstanding and deep historical narratives of the DSA itself and how the DSA accounts for the 60s and the gains and the failures of the 60s. Because what, you know, the DSA is coming out of Max Schachman, who I mentioned. They are orienting to the labor movement. Now, the Schachmanites fall out among themselves. Um, the so-called right Schachmanites around Bayard Rustin who eventually found the organization Social Democrats USA, they support the more traditionally conservative um, AFL bureaucracy, AFL-CIA bureaucracy around George Meany. And then the ostensibly more progressive left wing of the Shackenites, um, led by Michael Harrington and Walter Ruther is, is around and others, they support the sections of the labor movement that are anti-war and therefore um, some of the milieu around MLK, for example. Um, what you get in both of those narratives is the idea that what it means to get politically serious is to align oneself with one section of the labor movement, right, or another. And so the hippies are seen as politically unserious. They're the bad 60s, you know, the lazy, wasteful 60s, because the good 60s is the alliance of the labor movement, especially in a figure like Walter Ruther, with the civil rights movement to enter the LBJ, Great Society Political Coalition, and pursue that political strategy, right, of working within and around the Democratic Party and its movements. So that's what it means to get politically serious for the DSA. So in that context, I would actually want to rehabilitate a little bit, you know, again, to try to be charitable, a figure like Paul Buell, who is aligned actually and participating for a while in this socialist party building project that Weinstein and Christopher Lash had led. Because Buell's notion is that politics, like, like capitalist politics has already, and I don't want to put words in Buell's mouth, but I think he would agree with at least part of this. I've corresponded with him a little bit. And I see this in the old writings from the time. There's this notion that actually labor is locked up. The Democrats just have a lock on labor. And they're falling out among themselves. There's AFL-CIO, George Meany, pro-Vietnam War, labor bureaucracy with Byron Rustin joining that. And then there's the more, you know, 60s, like, kind of new lefty labor um, that has a certain proliferation in the 1970s. Um, and the other, and that's where the DSA is at, right? Like labor as a social movement among movements in the Big Ten. Um, they're falling out a little bit, but they all agree that again, you know, political seriousness is to be in and around the labor movement. So in, in that context, Paul Buell and others, there is maybe a rational kernel to the Gramscianism in that they're saying, well, what are sites of discontent and aspiration in this society? How are people, how is this politics failing people in this society in a way that we could organize and we could politicize and we could help to transform to make a base for socialist politics? And I think they're not wrong to look at culture, actually, and to say, well, what if we start a magazine? Or what if we start a club? I mean, you know, it's, it's a long way from there to seizing the trust, but you have to start somewhere. And they're not wrong to think about it in those terms. Like, what if we start with, you know, cultural discontents? So that's where I wouldn't want to entirely throw in with that narrative, because I think that um, the DSA narrative ends up, you know, that, that reading of the 60s, the bad hippie 60s versus the serious labor civil rights 60s, it all implies a politics within or around the Democratic Party, you know. And so um, if you're talking about um, some alternative, you know, beyond that, I think that's useful. But, but of course, obviously, everyone would agree that, like, dropoutism, like pure lifestyleism, does not inherently have any kind of political valence. I mean, any of the old socialists would have just recognized that as probably, like, petit bourgeois decadence, which people are free to engage in, but it doesn't get us to, to socialism, you know. So I was thinking a little bit more about how you open this speech and asking people like contemporary or popular, like gaps in the contemporary popular understanding. And one of the first things, like on the left specifically, that will get thrown at Debs is 
you know, his, his quote, like, socialism is not special to offer black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could speak to the legacy of, like, Debsian socialism and the influence in regards particularly to, like, the civil rights movement. And I'm thinking of, like, the lineage of, like, April Brand up through Bear Grass and up to see, like, yeah. the founding of, like, Social Democrats USA around, like, the, the government. Yeah, absolutely. That's a it's a very interesting lineage. And yes, as you mentioned, um, A. Philip Randolph joins the SPA during the lifetime of Debs. I think it's like in the um, 19 teens, um, something like that. And he remains with it. And you're right, like he actually remains kind of surprisingly, um, he remains with it and, and aligns alongside Bayard Rustin with what is seen as the more conservative faction um, that become, you know, kind of proto neoconservative in the 1970s because they want to break so forcefully with the McGovernite Democrat coalition. I think, you know, in that, um, in that Debs quote that you mentioned, he has a great turn of phrase, and I'll botch it, but he says something like, we will neither flatter nor abuse black Americans. And I think in that phrase, he's basically pointing to how the Socialist Party is neither the Republican Party nor the Democratic Party, right? He's staking out a third position because... We're very familiar with this from our time and really ever since the 1930s in a Democratic Party vein. But of course, what was the Republican Party doing at that time? It was setting up like a black patronage machine. It didn't help everyone, you know, or not, not you know, nearly many people, but there was something to it, right? Like it was a way of binding a black voting constituency um, to the Republican Party, oftentimes in urban areas, not exclusively. And this would often involve a certain kind of flattery as any kind of you know, urban ethnic or other constituency politics does, right? And so I think Debs is signaling, well, we're not going that road. We're not going to become an urban ethnic constituency machine politics. And when he saw them starting to become like a labor machine constituency politics under Berger in Milwaukee, he objected to that no less because he didn't like the model of you know, interest group machine interest group brokerage or machine politics, um, you know, as such, like in any variety, be it ethnic, racial, or, or labor. Um, so there was a rejection of the Republican Party's approach, but then obviously, very clearly, there was a rejection of the Democratic Party's approach, um, you know, which was legally enforced segregation. Um, at one point, you know, kind of famously, he refused, Debs refused to speak before a segregated audience in the South. Um, and so the audience was actually forced to, to integrate. So he was sort of pushing, pushing the bounds. Um, but of course, it's difficult. You know, there were times, there were probably many, many times when they operated illegally in that sense, you know, holding integrated meetings, like actually breaking the law. But of course, that's the nature of it. And some very uncharitable new left historians have looked at that and said, you know, oh, see, they, they loved segregation. They wanted segregation. Well, there were some, you know, there were in the party. And I think you have to read that as a function precisely of the party's ability to organize wider and wider sections of society. In other words, where do you want people who support socialism that have racial prejudice? Do you want them maybe in the party where you can convince them, you know, as long as they don't, you know, sort of harm people or, you know, have a deleterious effect on the party's work, you want to oppose that. But maybe you do countenance some sort of conservative position in all kinds of areas of life because precisely in and through the party, you recruit people to a left-wing revolutionary view, right? That was the model. So the party did at times countenance anti-black racism, but there were many other times when, um, you know, they were simply selectively following and selectively breaking the law, um, you know, around segregation. Um, yeah, you know, I think in general, this is, this is an analogy, but one of the best and most indicative pieces of writing that I've read from the party was actually their treatment of low-wage um, workers from Mexico in the American Southwest. And they basically acknowledged, you know, again, to reprise kind of what I said earlier, yes, the capitalists are using the segment of the population to break strikes. Yes, they may have a lower standard of living, and that may offend the sensibility of working class immigrants whose families have you know, toiled for 30 or 40 years to try to raise themselves up to a higher standard of living. So these people with their lower standards for reproducing themselves in society who are being brought into lower wages um, kind of lower the, the floor of the working class in, its, in, in the society. Um, 
we recognize that's happening and we reject it, but we're going to organize that. You know, so I think Debs, that was 100% Debs' approach. And he also um, very consistently, and actually even the Socialist Parties of America's right wing, to my knowledge, pretty consistently, even someone like Berger held that black Americans should have equal political rights. In other words, voting, civil liberties. Where they kind of, you know, finally where they um, maybe uh, reached a certain modus vivendi with the political reality at the time was that people wanted to accuse them of like forced social societal integration. Like, like oh, you know, it's sort of like how people said, oh, the socialists are going to make you abolish your family. You know, <laughs> that like, like the norms and liberal um, boundaries within civil society uh, that, that the socialists wished to run roughshod over those. And so they basically said, well, no, like, People have their rights to freely associate. We can't tell you, you know, who to bring in your bedroom or who to, you know, we're not trying to be in charge of that, um, like our critics accuse us of doing vis-a-vis -vis black Americans. Um, but we're saying we, we stand for full political equality. So, yeah, those are some of the ideas that come to mind. I guess I have kind of two questions Mm -hmm. um, the two questions, hopefully not two different. I was just kind of curious if we thought there was any significance to Lenin calling Debs, you know, the American people and, and not calling him the American Kautsky or so, you know, he's just like me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Almost as good as me. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's not to, Lenin not the narcissist. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Lenin and, and, uh, and Kautsky. Um, but just, you know, Kautsky has come up a lot in uh -huh. the conversation, and we seem to be moving closer and closer to this idea of the SPA being very similar to the SPD. Mm -hmm. Kautsky looms large in this, yeah. and yet Lenin didn't call this the American Kautsky, he called him the American Mabel. So, yeah. thinking about that. The other then, I'm kind of curious what would be the difference, you know, between saying we need another Debsian model SBA party versus saying we need another uh, German style SPD party. Uh, mm. And, you know, I, I can imagine perhaps why some folks were not saying we need, you know, the, the SPD all over again would have to do with. 1914, um, but I'm kind of struck by the, the comparisons, you know, with that. And then just thinking about the DSA, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I'm kind of imagining, um, well, thinking about the DSA, you know, I think broadly the DSA uh, is still or doesn't want to reckon with its connection to the Democratic Party, and I think that's something that uh, Eugene Debs sounds like would have chewed them up for it. Um, would yeah. he have joined the DSA and argued his positions? Perhaps. But I think he would have been, you know, sounds like he would have been uncompromising on this point that you need political independence. Um, and then also this point about, I was just thinking about that, you know, we um, were talking about Mother Jones and this idea of if you are. I don't know if workerist is the right word, but if you are going to do what's best for the workers and follow the workers and kind of shun politics, then you end up making some big compromises. And I think that tendency does also exist in the DSA. Yeah. Um, so I think that's also something kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, excellent questions. Um, I may ask you to repeat some, um, but just to start off um, about, um, you know, Lenin describing... Debs, shorthand, American Bible. Um, there may be a deeper answer to this, but I think two factors come to mind. Um, one, that, um, you know, as I tried to suggest, I'm not sure that um, Debs, in his writings, I, I think you have a probably the clearest expression of a dialectical. Marxist conception 
of how these socialist parties are changing capitalism and actually um, taking capitalism within themselves and sort of transforming both themselves and capitalism in the process. I think you have the clearest expression of that theoretically, probably in people like Lenin and Luxembourg. Um, I think that, um, you know, Debs unfortunately is often maligned as like not a theoretician. He, um, in his, I think in his writings, there's a clear orientation to the left wing, the revolutionary wing of the Marxist Second International, pretty much up until the end. And I think Lenin grants that up until the end. Um, but there may have been, you know, again, this kind of tendency towards party unity. I'm not sure if that's what Lenin had in mind. But I think, to answer your question most straightforwardly, I think what Lenin most had in mind is that my understanding, I'm not an expert on Babel, but I think he was also sort of recruited out of the working class. I think he did not begin as a kind of Marxist intellectual trying to clarify and help to lead and organize. Yeah, the work. Kal Kalsky was a theorist. He was an intellectual. He, he right. wrote for the party. He was not an organizer, not a party founder. Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, Debs and Babel were, I think Babel was probably a little older, I, I really am not sure, but like they're, they're an older generation, I think. Yeah, than, yeah. Than Lenin and Luxembourg. Oh yeah, definitely. And I suspect they're also both great orators who can find an audience with the working class. Um, but, but again, have a definitive set of political coordinates within these socialist parties. Like they're not simply manipulable, you know, in any, any old way. Um, what was the next question? Yes. Oh, just if there would be a difference between saying we need the SBA again or we need the SBB again. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, I think you're right that a lot of that comes down to, you know, as I tried to, to point out the SPA, because it seems like, um, maybe like the Kautskian party at an earlier stage before it becomes entirely clear that a split had been necessary, right? Like imagine, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's somewhat of a false hypothetical, but had the SPA been the leading party of the Second International, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say in retrospect when exactly the party should have been split, if and when, you know, like th that it had become, it had evolved such a pernicious reformist tendency within itself that actually multiple socialist parties were required to, to lead the working class to socialism, that a split from the party would, would be necessary. It's hard to identify that. So I think you're right that the SPA is more recoverable um, you know, to, to some revolutionary Marxists looking at the situation you know, retrospectively. Um, yeah, for that reason. Um, was there another part to that? or? Not really. I was just kind of, I think, reiterating this idea that Dennis, I think, would have, would have critiqued the DSA. I don't you know. Yeah. Maybe he was doing the DSA, but maybe he would, have, he would, he would have critiqued, I think, this Democratic Party. Yeah. The 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 waffling on that issue at least. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, you know, progressive, labor-oriented, and social movementist coalitions existed at that time and there were leftists who joined and organized and supported them and they were called the Wilsonites you know that's it's again it's a very it's in a very prototypical form that gets further elaborated in the new deal that gets a certain political spin in the Henry Wallace campaign that gets another permutation in the civil rights movement around the McGovern campaign but the basic political logic you can trace all the way back to, to Wilson yeah and Debs was pretty clear which which side he was on yeah, I mean, Gompers was, was progressive. You know, right. Was, oh, yeah. There's a Wilson guy. Yeah, probably all those figures were actually to the left of the contemporary DSA. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's very well said. Yeah. Um, so, your talk you also emphasized the, the Leninist Party, mm -hmm. um, but also like a critique of the Leninist Party. Mm -hmm. um, like, how's your critique? A critique of them, so a critique, or not that easy, but the, the neo Dazians, a critique of them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm just wondering where, where do you think this leaves like the traditional um, people or you know, the Trotsky is still around um, the Leninists, where does it leave um, you know, base themselves off the, like to make it more concrete, they base themselves off like the, the Third International Congress, that model of the party, where does that leave that, that model of the party, this is the, the dustbin of history? 
Yeah, well, that's that's one of the hardest questions, and you know, there, it's good that there may be diff somewhat differing points of view on this within Platypus. But speaking for myself, just as I try to parse out these questions, um, it seems to me that um, Lars Lee actually makes a contribution um, to recovering Lenin as a Kautskyan early on. Um, I, you know, one can can part with Lee on other issues, but I think that basic point that before before it becomes necessary to split the Socialist Party, like 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 the basic I guess stages, if you will, would be that you found the Mass Socialist Party, you you succeed so well in organizing different constituencies of society that you push capitalism into a more progressive mode as you demand reforms. Therefore, a capitalist progressivism takes hold within your party and it becomes necessary to split your party. Now, if you never actually found that kind of mass party to begin with, then you can never really have the conditions that make politically sensible the split, right? And so where does that leave you? Well, I have to say Shackman sounds plausible. That leaves you with sectarianism. Draper thinks so too. There are people who don't, at least quite so clearly, lead the left into the Democratic Party, people like Draper, um, who Lee actually cites, Lars Lee actually cites, um, you know, who, um, who are aware of this. And so um, the problem of sectarianism, um, and, and, and actually, again, the conservative nature of sectarianism, um, it's, it's not leading to the revolution, so it's, it's conservative. So in that sense, I personally find compelling the notion that what would have to happen in the future if there is ever going to be a Marxian socialist politics in the United States is that you start with something like the SPA, but with the knowledge that that may not be sufficient by any means, and perhaps fairly quickly, if you're very successful, you know, to actually lead to a socialist outcome. I have a follow-up question. Um, just actually, this makes me think of, okay, to be provocative again, actually some socialist parties do not start off Socialist parties, um, like their beginnings, yeah. or not. So, the example I think of are the Novaniks in Russia. So, before there was a emancipation of labor group, there were there was terrorism. And they were kind of populist, broadly, right? Yeah, some they were populist yeah. Yeah, yeah. assassins. Uh -huh. like Lenin's brother um, mm -hmm. tried to blow up the bazaar, or some yeah. officially got executed. They were related. There was like two faces. It was like the, the bomb throwing like anarchists. And the Narodniks oh. like went to the to people, people, to the people, went to the villages, and then got kicked out by the villagers. <laughs> uh, but and they were—I don't remember exactly—but they were not identical. But right. they were, yeah. Um, okay, the but there was that. But I think even in America, Nixon was assassinated by an anarchist. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. um, and that guy tried to kill Henry Frick. <laughs> okay, so whatever. I just, I just raised this as like, like to provocatively say it, like. Is it possible to start just with a socialist party? Um, is that the first step? Because in this case, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying everyone should be a terrorist <laughs> and go out for bombs. Um, but like, is there is there a possibility that actually another stage, even another stage even before that has to be done? Yeah. Well. Well, you know, so there's one, um, an, an, a very early, I believe, member, or at least participant in Platypus named Tim Barker, who's now a successful academic. He actually wrote, I believe, an undergraduate thesis, a very smart one, on the James Weinstein party building project that I discussed. And before I read this other PhD thesis that has more recently come out, that was like the go-to text on history of that party, uh, party building project. And Barker comes from a DSA type politics. So again, what does he conclude? He concludes their party failed because it wasn't aligned to labor. Just goes to show, don't try to start a party unless you've won all of the labor movement. But of course, the labor movement is already won by the Democratic Party. So you have to spend your time in and around the Democrats to, you know, and then it's forever and on. Um, okay, but I think he actually, he did have a point that like to start a party, you have to have a constituency. There has to be some civil social force that you're organizing, that you're recruiting. And actually part of what makes it a party is that you have multiple constituencies, right? So if you think about the four heads of the SPA, you have Debs, he's bringing 
He has the American Railway Union. A lot of them, they're like remnants of the Pullman strike. A lot of them want to found a colony where they can solve all their economic woes. There's a lot of, you know, factionalism, a big split, 1897, 1898. But eventually, like, he has, you know, a core constituency there. And they bring along, again, out of populism, people like Appeal to Reason. They're, they're recruiting other people from populism. Morris Hillquip, what does he bring? Well, he's recruited out of Daniel de Leon's Socialist Labor Party. He brings a lot of immigrant Jewish garment workers who have a huge electoral machine and a lot of labor organizing on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So um, Jewish Daily Forward, still around in the form of the publication The Forward. Like that's their publication and that's their base, right? Um, so that comes in. And then you have Berger, obviously, with the Milwaukee machine, and he's advising all of these other municipal electoralists across the country. And then you have Haywood, who, who brings um, you know, this, this willingness to organize the unorganized, such that he says, you know, it's actually, if you have an electoral party, well, children are working and they can't vote, and immigrants are working and they can't vote. And you have all these people where you know, an electoral party isn't really serving them, but maybe you can get someone elected and then they can deputize a sheriff during a strike to hold the Pinkertons off. Or, you know, maybe they can pass a reform that benefits the ability of, you know, the unions or the Wobblies to organize in that town, right? So even Haywood, it's often neglected, um, until 1912, actually sees a lot of reasons why socialists should run for and take elected office, right? So even he, as much as he's like the anti-electoralist of the party, his faction, even they see a reason why it should be in part an electoral party, that it could be useful to unions to have socialists in elected office who are aligned with their aims. But I guess my point in saying all that is that you need, um, you do need multiple civil social constituencies who are bringing perhaps sometimes competing um, but ultimately at least loosely aligned objectives to the electoral work of the party um, and to, you know, and, and are aligned on the goal of having a political, a specifically party political organization, um, you know, to, to work to, uh, to eventually take governing power. So, um, yeah, I think in the future something, you know, what it would look like, it's difficult to imagine. Um, you know, it could be, I mean, union uh, organizing, the level of union organizing in this country has fallen to such lows that I think that um, there could be a lot of upstart organizing efforts that may not find a political home, you know, within the Democrat or Republican parties, um, you know, sometime in the future, it's hard to say, but it could be beyond unions as well. It could intervene in forms of um, social reproduction. Um, you know, it could be uh, it could be a lot of different things. Like, tenants. Yeah, could be tenants organizing. Um, so I think that's what you would have to have. So I think Tim Barker, you know, I, I kind of reject his overall interpretation. You need to just follow labor wherever it leads. Um, but he has a point that you need some constituency. Otherwise, it's not a real party. You can get a bunch of Marxist intellectuals, you can put the alphabet soup of Marxist organizations all together in one big organization, and that wouldn't really do anything unless they were meaningfully building constituencies and organizing constituencies in and around the party. I, I, I just sensed, I, I, I couldn't uh, understand exactly what the, uh, the argument you were making was, or like that, you know, what it was about, but you, you ended with like a a note uh, that to me sounded like you were a little bit more uh, black-pilled uh, uh, about about uh, doomer-pilled <laughs> about Bevzian socialism that you yeah. might have been a few years ago. But yes. I, I feel like I, I like missed yes. exactly why that was. You said something about how it's always like it, it could potentially be just this like thing that always leads to the Democratic Party, or, or yeah, like. Yeah. But I, I didn't follow completely. Well, I'll be very transparent, um, you know, perhaps too transparent. But when I talked to Ben about this talk, I asked, like, what are people thinking about? Like, why does anyone even care about this? What's the political circumstance now? I'd like to actually start coming to the reading group here more often, but I haven't been for a while. So I feel really disconnected to, like, what is happening among students on campus. And Ben said, well, you know, there are some people really interested in this Marxist unity caucus during the DSA and in the DSA. And again, I say with all sincerity, like if there actually is a break and like at least somewhat politically serious people try to found like a neo kautskian type of party, I will sincerely join. Like, so it's not, it's not an animus. I would actually be very open to that. But I have to 
I, I cannot in good conscience like not raise the history of neo Debsian revivals, or if you prefer neo Kautskian revivals, coming out of a crisis of ultimately, you know, some kind of either Stalinist or broadly social democratic reformist or opportunist politics to begin with, you know, raising this history and legacy of Debsian socialism only to sort of ultimately turn it into a way for leftists to think about working in and around the Democratic Party, right? So I can't, you know, five years ago, that seemed, I suppose, um, you know, the, the this kind of, um, I suppose the neo Kautskyan moment was more of a naive, like, rediscovery for me a few years ago. But now seeing how it's potentially being put in the service of Democratic Party politics, I just have to, you know, I have to flag that. Or really dissolving into it more than right. being put in the service, because I, 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 I'm not sure the Democrats need, need the PSA that much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's actually the uh, saddest That thing. was like, uh, had its moment in 2018 or something. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So that's very transparent. Mm-hmm. That's where that's coming from. It's just me and Ben talking and thinking, okay, I guess it's relevant to mm-hmm. address this right now. Yeah. I was gonna ask, um, based on like sort of like the history of the S, uh, the SBA, um, I was wondering to what extent could you make an argument that like the, that like splitting on basically that like trying to split from a party is probably the worst tactical decision that you can make rather than like forcing a split on the other side. Like you would want to actually sort of like debate and like sort of force the conflict to happen and push the other side out rather than just simply like pulling out with the minority. Yeah, so that's maybe how like for example Marxist unity people might see themselves operating in. Well, I'm in Marxist unity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, again, I would say. I I mean, I I I wouldn't say that. What I just said is how we think of it, or like whatever. I'm just putting forward the argument. Yeah. Well, again, you know, I would say sincerely, more power to you. Like, if you actually pull that off, that would be, um, you know, that would. I, I think that would be a positive development. But um, it's, you know, I would just say beware the quicksand. <laughs> you know, that maybe the harder you fight, the the deeper you'll sink. Um, I could be wrong, but um, just the judgment I have based on my study of this, which is imperfect and, you know, subjective, but I just, it's difficult for me to see that as um, being particularly likely. Um, But uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of models and maybe what it amounts to is you're just sort of, um, you know, propagandizing or recruiting to cadre and ones and twos like you would be anywhere, you know, Um, I don't think it really takes on, precisely for the reasons we just discussed, I don't think it really takes on the pretense of party political work, because I actually think if, if you wanted to sort of start to assemble the materials that could be combined into something like a neo kautskian party, what you might actually want to do is start civil social organizing alongside intellectual education. And you might want to do that in a milieu, if possible, that's as least dominated, as little dominated by either of the two parties currently as possible. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a more open field now for civil social organizing than there has been in a long time because of the um, sort of decline of the social boundedness, like the the social binding of the two parties, um, their ability to reach out in society. Um, I think that has withered over the past decade. So it seems like the field is open, but I think I, I do worry about people with genuinely good intentions to you know, move forward with socialist politics, just being drawn back into that gravitational pull of, of the Democrats. Because if you organize a civil social constituency, that's going to happen anyway. <laughs> so you might as well at least organize something and then have the battle over trying to keep it out of the gravitational pull of the Democrats. But if you start in the gravitational pull of the Democrats, like I, it's, it's difficult for me to see where that gets you. But again, I'd be happy to be proven wrong in practice. I will join. <laughs>
when the break happens. <laughs> you can count me in. Yeah. So I guess, uh, like, with regard to what you say and that, uh, say, like, civil service progress is going to, it, it, like, no matter what, it's going to, uh, it will be attracting to the greater, you know, greater circle of the Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess this is, uh, like, would it require, say, uh, like, I, I look towards the, uh, like the, the movement of the 60s, right, and how there was a genuine energy there. I don't believe that, yeah. that you know, it was just sort of uh, Western energy, I mean, purely just this, uh, but, um, you know, what, what I think of is, uh, like, I, I think of our, like, the average, I guess, American subject, and I speak a bit in conjunction here, and that we connect virtue with money, a pure resource acumation, right? Yeah. Uh, how, and we, we see money as a shortcut to virtue, and that we're willing to step over people and Cheap and steal in order to uh, in, in order to accumulate wealth and therefore virtue. Right? And so, I guess my question is, uh, like I, I think of how uh, like Debs viewed the suffering of people in the South. He viewed yeah. the suffering of working people, and that engendered just such a, 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 a it stirred such a feeling within him that he had no choice but to become <coughs> socialist. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't this I, I don't believe that psychedelics are really they're they're not they're not like you just oh man if you if you did this drug the world changes, right? That's that's not that's that's not it, right? But I guess you could say within the sixties there was at least a change of consciousness that if not directed people towards socialism allowed for at least the 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 priming of that, the, the open mindedness of that within someone's mind that could point someone towards the solution. Right, uh, or, or point someone, point someone in the direction that Marxism was the solution to this. I, I think of a friend back home who uh, grew up with very extremely conservative parents, right? And he 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 volunteered for for a while and uh, also did psychedelics, and he was like, oh, "Well, what you're saying all makes sense." <laughs> <You know? laughs> so the drugs did it, and I'm like, "No, it's not that. It's the fact that you view these people hurting." Yeah. And I told you about this one guy, Marx, you should go look into it type thing if you're if you're really feeling that sort of thing, right? And so it's like I, I think what I'm trying to get at here is like is is engendering like that that shift in consciousness or at least that willingness for a shift in consciousness, is that a necessary prerequisite toward the socialist movement? Uh, mm -hmm. changing the minds of people, uh, and the minds of the, like a majority of uh say the capitalist subjects who fuse money as virtue to get them outside of that built mode of thinking to get them towards a better way of looking at things. Is that is that necessary? Yeah. Well, let me... I, I think I have an answer for you. It's a little bit indirect. But um, once they started the party, a few different um, constituencies of the party and of society come to mind. Um, one is, interestingly, Jane Addams around Hull House. Now, someone who I mentioned, actually, L.G. Martin Simons, he, he becomes, um, he's kind of around this movement of middle-class intellectuals getting educated in university and then going out into society to try to do social good. And he spends time around the Hull House movement, and he's actually politicized to socialism and joins the party. Now, Jane Addams, on the other hand, um, I'm not an expert on her thought, but one thing I very... Um, poignantly recall her reading years ago, reading her, um, a writing of hers years ago that stated that she actually argued at one point that the U.S. Civil War was unnecessary because you don't want to bring things in society to that level of conflict. Now, surely we could all agree unnecessary war, unnecessary conflict is to be but she was pro World War One, though. Right, pro World War One, but anti Civil War, right? Because <laughs> right, totally wrong. Yeah. So you know, so. And, and, and what does that show? You know, she, she really had such a conciliationist view, right, about the society of her time, the class conflict taking place in her time, that she wanted to take the edges off, but she did not want to push things to a point where there might be a fundamental change in social production in favor of the working class taking governing power and, you know, operating society to abolish unemployment. You know, I think she saw her role more 
um, as ameliorative. And this is a not uncommon role. Now that said, you know, again, as the example of A.M. Simons shows, um, that you can work with people like that. You can say, well, we're going to have a socialist soup kitchen or a socialist, you know, we have, we have our end goal, which is freedom, which is social transformation. But as a means of getting there, we're going to offer amelioration. So I think that they did um, recruit a lot of people on that basis. I didn't really talk about this, but there are entire books about preachers who were converted to socialism and actually some of the greatest uh, spokespersons for the Socialist Party during this time, um, you know, on various like local or statewide speaking circuits. They recruited a lot of um, religious people and they did not see that as antithetical. They, they recruited the um, Bohemian Greenwich Village types, right, who were doing all kinds of things in their private lives, including drug experimentation, um, you know, and that all well and good. But they were also able to recruit, and perhaps this was politically more significant, I would say, they were able to recruit these preachers who, um, you know, had their own kind of civil, social, ameliorative um, operations going on, you know, in churches and, um, you know, forms of welfare relief and all of that. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's not unimportant. And I think it's, um, it's probably a lesson now fairly well digested. When I was coming up on the left over 10 years ago, it perhaps wasn't. But you don't want to pit, your, pit yourself in one sociocultural constituency against another, right? You want a party that's able to organize both the godless heathens and the, you know, faithful church-going types, right? And that's actually what they were. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is they actually had a millionaire socialists organization. Now, you know, one, yeah, truly. And, and, and you can look into, they actually had, I think, a conference at one point. And in fact, I think even Victor Berger, there's an anecdote of Victor Berger feeling like so socially out of place for all of, again, his kind of reformism that at one point he says something like, well, we'll make you, we'll make you pay. You know? he, like he, he like feels out of place, you know, with these millionaires, despite the fact that they're contributing all this money to the party. Um, but uh, they were able to do that. You know, they were actually able, and who, you know, who really cares at that point if the millionaire has some belief that's not perfectly in line, as long as, you know, as long as someone who has the party's goal well in mind is able to utilize their, their donation, that's the important thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, and actually, uh, now that I think of it also, the, um, the author Adam Hochschild has written a book recently about Rose Pastor Stokes, who um, I believe married into wealth, um, or married into um, wealth and was like a major organizer of the party. And I think her husband at that time also was. And there's a bit of a like cross-class romance story there. And I just mentioned that because he's like a very famous historian, publishes like best-selling history books. So um, yeah, so I think that's that's what I would say. But like those impulses you're describing, I think they're profound, actually. Like I think like they, and the socialists were able to read the rational kernel in Christianity and not, not like get trapped in the culture war about it. But that, that sort of like, that, that Christian virtue is what allowed someone to do some problem. Yeah, yeah. Other questions, thoughts? All right, well, thank you, everyone. This has been a great discussion.